Hold on to your butt, Storm Chasers. Here's the man of the hour, the painter extraordinaire, Thunderhead. And the crowd goes mild. How are we doing tonight, folks? Roland is indeed first, and congratulations on that. To Square, good to see you, White Wolf Rangonia's data nerd. The fucking painting crew. The crew, folks. That's what we got in here tonight. How's everybody doing? Oh god, this coffee's old. I thought it... When did I make this? Oh, it's so acidic. <laughs> I hate it when I do that. I've started to, uh... I've started to get into cold brew. And, uh, I've, I've gone... I've gone out of focus for no reason that I can determine. I love my C920 and it's autofocus that shouldn't be... Should not be working. Let's see if we can fix that right quick. There we go. There we go. That's a little bit better, I think. Go ahead and keep that window open so I can get into it. It's like me, old, acidic. Yeah, I mean, uh, bitter. Um, dark. Awful. Misanthropic. No, that's not a good description for for coffee. I think that's just just on one side of this particular coin. Hypnotic Mom, welcome in. It is always fantastic to see you in chat. I've got a um, I'm 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 working on putting together a little a little clip, a little clip from Aliens as requested. I think you'll like it when I get it done. Oh, why am I still drinking? <laughs> Hang on. One more. Oh, get it away from me. I just need the little... I just need the little boost. Oh, my God. Just in time. How you doing today, A. Dodge? Hethrier, it's always a pleasure to see you. POV42, going to be working on the Desert Bus Mech tonight. Should hopefully be relaxing. I hope it's relaxing, too. Relaxation. <sighs> this hobby should never be stressful. I know sometimes it is. I know sometimes we can stress ourselves over the silliest of things, but this hobby should never be stressful. If you're having stress over painting minis, take a fucking break. Go do something else. Uh, Orcs Must Die 3 just came out on Steam. Go get it and play it. It's a great game. Seriously, if you guys played Orcs Must Die 1, 2, or 3, they're all fucking fantastic games. Ignore the... There was one that came out, I think, called Orcs Must Die Unleashed. In between there, Unchained, something like this. Ignore that one. It, it, that was that was a, that was a weird, half-assed entry. But uh, I like I like those games. I just got Orcs Must Die three last night, and I had this. I, I had to pull myself away from it because I had this. You know that moment when you realize that every time you look at the clock and back, somehow like an hour and a half goes by, and it, you're like, oh, I looked. You know, I've been playing for ten minutes, and you're like, oh no, it's been at least a full hour. Oh. God, yeah, it does that to me. It does that to me bad. I like cold brew. I, I hadn't really tried it until recently. But um, they've got some like pre-done cold brews at, uh, at Costco that have actually been pretty interesting. It just, like, it, it, it takes, the, the process takes that, that bitter acidity out of it. I don't really understand enough about the process to comment on it further than that. My entire uh, opinion on cold brew is, tastes good, I like it. Hamburg Tack, it's good to see you getting a new kitten in two days. Hey Dodge, that's exciting. That's damned exciting. This latest kitten that I got just sort of showed up in my house all of a sudden, but then I suspect it was apparent that after losing two cats last year, I was in a, I was in a weird place and I, I, I really needed I really needed a nice little fuzzy fry. You like this? This is a piece of handmade stoneware that is based on. I could I could find it in the catalog. It is based on a 13th to 14th century piece of German stoneware 
like the original artifact that this is based on, it's it's broken in half, I think the original picture was, but when I bought it, like the guy I had, he was like, you know, you can buy these historical pieces of stoneware, and by the way, here are pictures of the original artifacts that they're based on, and I particularly liked this one. It's wonderful. Ah, getting drunk just like our ancestors. I have a nice... I can't remember the name of it. I'll go get the bottle in a bit, because I'm going to have to refresh, but I have a nice uh, Belgian golden ale in it tonight. Or Chris, yeah, tell me about it. I've had to ship a few things up to Canada lately, and it is always astonishing how much money they want to ship to Canada, man. What are you trying to get? delicious. Mm, nom, 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 nom. All right, let me clean up my desk a little bit here when we get started. I was just saying to Data Nerd and Chris Allo the other day, guys, I cannot, I cannot wait to get back into the fall winter season this year. It is going to be, it is going to be something. Oh, excuse me, Hamburg. Here's to you, man. I just, god damn, the spring and summer just pull me away from all my projects so much, and I have to say, I'm just, just, just rip that glove, um, I'm just so incredibly grateful for, for this stream, for this community, for you guys who keep me tethered to my hobbies, and that sounds like a funny sort of thing, but it's easy to lose track of this, of, of hobbies like this. You tell yourself, oh, I'm just not going to paint this week, and a week goes by, and then two weeks, and then a month, and you haven't sat down at the paint desk, and it's like, oh, i got to get back to it, and it becomes stressful, and then it's not about having fun. It's just this tether, this, this motivation to keep coming back and keep doing at least a little bit of work through a time when otherwise I probably would have stepped away for a while. It's, uh... <sighs> What's the word? What, what, is, what is the word for something when you set out with a goal and then you accomplish that goal? <laughs> like, what, what, is, what is that feeling? I'm not sure. It happens so rarely. <laughs> but the goal was to, to keep me painting through these shitty months when I first got started. Now we're uh, going to be coming up on two years in. We're about a year and a half in, and it's been doing its job admirably. Gratification, completion, success, climax, I, I'm, I'm not sure. The feeling of, of wearing another man's skin. Ah, feeling his every feeling, knowing his every thought. No one's going to get that reference. That is an obscure reference to a very particular part of a show that isn't even very popular. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not just saying words, but I, I'd be surprised if anybody had any fucking idea what I was talking about. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. How you doing today, Lore Friendly? Asri, it is always a pleasure to see you. Here we have from Roland. Tonight's drink is champagne yeasted golden pilsner. That sounds delicious. It was mentioned because Roland offered me a kit and I was all, it's going to be stupidly expensive. Oh, I see, I see. Wanted to paint some D&D &D minis at his day camp to show off. I said, okay, but you gotta use crap brushes out of the dollar store bag and craft paints. Good luck. Hey. You can accomplish quite a lot with even those simple tools. That is a very, very nice place to start. Teal Security. Not just any man's skin. Your skin. No, I, I don't, I'm not gonna. Uh, disclaimer. Uh, the streamer has no intention of skinning Teal Security and wearing his face as a mask while he does his little kooky dance. No intention at all. I mean, it might happen. But it won't be intentional. How you doing today, Teal Security? Can we get a shout out, by the way, for Teal Security and Orcris Studios? We have some truly amazing, truly talented streamers in the chat tonight, and it is always great to see these two hanging out. It, one of the, the best things, it, really, one of the best things that has come out of getting onto Twitch and, and starting all this has been, you know, broadly, you can just say the community, but I, I mean specifically the painting community. Not just the amazing people on the Thunderhead Studio Discord, but people like Teal Sakiri, people like Orcris Studios, people like Vergadarung, other paint streamers 
who, you know, you, you reach out and you network with some people. You're like, hey, we do the same thing. Let's network. Let's help each other out. But, you know, like with any group of friends, you discover some of these people you don't really interface with all that well. But over time, actual friendships come out of this. Actual connections, people that you like, people you paint the same thing as, people with similar styles, people who help motivate you. And, you know, if you're if you're getting started on Twitch and you're having some trouble with that, just just keep going because these relationships will naturally sort of sort of rise to the top. And having people like, like, or Kristen Teal Security in here is always inspirational. You fucking guys. You guys. Man, my Instagram, uh, feed has been just, like, dead lately. There's nothing but, but stream announcements, which is terrible. How you doing today, Vergaderung? It's good to see you. Almost done building my second combat patrol, so it'll be almost all my ad mech for the League assembled. Hell yes. The rest of the models are on the shelf at the LGS, but they've got your name on them, and that's what counts. Even if it's not actually written on them, or legally true, in your mind they've got your name on them. Yeah, yeah, you you are not wrong, Data Nerd. You are not wrong at all, so... Why don't we get going? Ten more follows, you guys. Ten more follows, and we're going to be having a giveaway for these... I really like these dice. Like, if I wasn't giving all of them away, I would be happy just having these as just all hundred of them. I would just use them for all my D6s from now on. I'm so glad that I went with, uh, with this color. Let me see if I can get it to actually show up a little bit here. It's such a rich color when you can get the light going through it just so. The logo came out so crisp. But yeah, 10 more follows. We will be doing a giveaway of... Uh, I think we've got... I, I think after I pulled out all the, the special ones that I wanted to give to people and keep for myself, we've got uh, 35 sets. 35 pairs. And we'll have at least one more run of these dice going down and getting given away. Um, these aren't going to be sold. These are just going to be commemorative sets. So, uh, you know, tell your friends. Get him in here. You're like, hey, go give Thunderhead a follow just so we can have a giveaway. No, that's not. That's 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 not the point. The point is to thank you wonderful people for being here all this time and for, for supporting this insane endeavor every place that it's been and hopefully every, every place that it's going. Zio Reimer, thank you so, so much for 16 months of subscribing. Working mids and 2 a.m. comes pretty freaking quick. Zio Reimer, you have a fantastic night, man. Don't work too hard. And and thank you so much for stopping in. It's always a pleasure to see you in chat. Excel decided to freeze and crash, and the recovery only happened on the other one you were working on, so lost like four hours worth of work. Hmm. Uh, uh, Sorry to hear that, Berg. As long as you got as long as you got paid for <laughs> both iterations of that four hours. Uh, so many awesome people kicking around here and pushing, uh, keep pushing and teaching me, yourself included. Teal, I'm, I'm, if I have been, and I've said this before, like, Soul Stream is worth it for each person who says that I helped them to continue their own painting journey. That's, uh, that is, that is the most that I could possibly hope for. It is, it is both humbling and validating at the same time, and you guys give that to me. Shock just clicked follow five times. We're halfway. I don't. I don't think that's how it works. Um, but I, I can't actually disprove it. So who knows? Maybe we are. Oh. So I mentioned Orcs Must Die three. Legitimately, if anyone does wind up buying it, uh, first of all, I suggest playing Orcs Must Die one and two. They're both fucking great games. Like, I really, really like those games as far as being, like, active action adventure tower defense. It's kind of tower defense, sort of. That, that's the broad theme. Um, it's, it's wave defense from waves of orcs coming through portals. If anyone does get Orcs Must Die 3, please let me know on the Discord because it has a co-op play mode. And I'd, I'd love, I'd love to jump in on some co-op games. Killing hordes of orcs. I got a number of the, uh... 
Unseen Battletech resin prints here. These are going to be going to Chaotic Harmony for his Retro Palooza booth. He's going to be going to a convention in October. And I'm hoping to have a whole series of these for him to give away as swag. Set these guys over here. I've got a bunch of Thunderbolts and Shadowhawks on right now. Yeah, I, I, he's, he's doing Battletech at the Retro Palooza. It's like a retro sci-fi con, is the impression that I'm under, and I can't think of anything more retro than Unseen Battle Max, man. That's, that, that's, some, that's some 80s business there. played the first two yeah they're they're a lot of fun they have a fun playful kind of story to them too like the story kind of exists is my bot not doing its job hang on i'm glad we discovered that early <laughs> at least i can see why it's not doing its job give me one second let me get the the bot up and running and then we'll slap down some oil paints Yeah, I, f I, I sometimes forget that I even put Ender 3 on that graphic, but yeah, I need to update that with uh, Neptune 2 so as to be totally accurate. The bot should be up and running in just a minute. Oh, come on, chair. Here we go. I still need to go to Ikea and get a new chair. I just... Oh, man. Getting out of the house these days. There's so few things that I generally want to go out for, but I just need to take a day and go spend a couple hours at Ikea doing some shopping in general. Oh, right, all right, all right. Where were we? We were working on our leather, as I recall, and it looks like we had gotten through our Terra Rosa on all four of these. Yeah, so we're going to dive into a little bit of yellow ochre, do some highlights, and we're going to move on to the metal. The Neptune 2 so far has been nice. It's a little, even with the silent motherboard, for whatever reason, its steppers are a little bit louder than the Ender 3, but not so loud that it bothers me. Um, other than that, it's been running reliably. I really haven't done anything to it. Uh, I need to pull out the PTFE tubing and put in a capture fitting and some Capricorn tubing, but I'm going to leave that until I have my first under extrusion issue. I'm kind of waiting to see how and when that happens. And also... As far as what's printing tonight, it is one of these. Which is my Space Cultist Pillar. This is done in transparent red, uh, what's it, PETG. It has a little void there at the bottom so you can put in some lights. The idea being to paint everything except this little design here and then have this illuminated red from the inside. And then in a separate piece, because this prints better in PLA, because PETG is a little bit too flexible for this. Mount that on there. And the idea is to create a board that looks like the interior of a space cultist temple. So you have these columns which kind of define the implied ceiling on the play area. I'm working on a whole set of these 
right now. Specifically, I'm designing them so that I can use them for Warcaster. But I mean, really, they're good for almost any 28mm war game. I think I'll probably wind up using them for Maelstrom's Edge as well. Spirits. Yeah, yeah. I've got a, I've got one big uh, BattleTech terrain project that I am, I am in the, I am in the cleanup and finishing stages of right now. At rear, and when that's done, that is gonna be such a huge weight off my mind. Do the next hex tech set release, which I'm literally hoping to have out of here inside the next 24 hours. There's just been. A couple little issues with the prints that have cropped up, and they're easy enough to fix, but they just take some, some, you know, I have to print the final product to be sure that I fixed it. So I'm going to get those out to Alex, and then I'm going to be turning the full force of my creative endeavors onto Warcaster for at least a month, and then coming back around to Hextech for some expansion pieces. Uh, what am I going to? <sighs> Yellow Ochre, that's what I was going to be using. Don't be talking about my fluids like that, Head Rear. I feel violated. That should be more than enough yellow ochre. One of the things I really do like using, or uh, one of the things I like about using oil paints is how little of them I have to use even for large projects. Mafik, it is good to see you, my friend. Some necromorph looking shit. Yeah, it definitely has um, some unitologist. Influence. In fact, broadly, when you look at the set, I can give you my primary visual influences for the whole set. It's going to be Unitology, the Brotherhood of Nod, and the Necromongers. Imagine, uh, you know, those three influences coming together in the mind of kind of a poor artist, and you will have what the set is going to look like. White spirits to thin my yellow ochre just a little bit more than it is at present. We don't want a lot of it. Put some white down, so I'm about to use it. So where's the giant Tesla coil? That's not no, they didn't brother you're, you're thinking of the obelisk of light, which was not a Tesla coil, White Wolf. It was a laser scorpion thing. This winter, I am planning on turning my sights on creating some 28mm 3D printable Brotherhood of Nod specific figures. I want to give a timeline on that, but it is something I'm going to be working on. Got a little bit of this white. good GDI figures. Eh, might wind up being part of it. Depends on how productive I am. We shall see. This is not the brush I want to be using. It's a little... A little blast it out. Let's go with something slightly finer. I am just destroying my synthetics. I need to learn better brush care with oils. There we go. Fuck the GDI, says Mafik. It's rare that we get so strong an opinion out of Mafik. What did the GDI ever do to you, buddy?
blend those in in a minute. One of the things I really do enjoy about oil painting is I don't have to think that much about doing my blending while I'm picking my highlight areas. I just kind of pick spots, put down my highlight colors, come back in, blend it in after. Ah, ooh. My thumb just did something funny. Yeah. Surprise Command & Conquer never got a tabletop or board game. Well, that would require them to be licensed to someone other than elect Electronic Arts whose specialty is not fostering the uh, properties that they own, but rather milking all the money they can out of them in the short term and then murdering the property. As they have done with Command & Conquer, as they have done with Dead Space, as they have done with countless other franchises that we knew and loved. Now they're about to turn around and profit off of Dead Space, even after killing the game, which is uh, kind of offensive, if I'm being honest. No idea what's going on with my thumb, but it started cramping up something mean. I'm just going to try to relax it while I paint. One of those is going to be a water, let me tell you. Oh, I can't breathe that. <coughs> I tried, but I can't. Maybe if I keep trying. <coughs> One day it'll work. And then I'll be Aquaman. Ah, ooh, that is tasty. Played Red Alert 2 and 3 in generals when our teacher showed that game in the computer lab. Yeah, Command & Conquer has been a great game series. Right up until Command & Conquer 4, when it all went wrong. That was a bad time. It was a real bad time, Command & Conquer 4. The realization that everything that we knew and loved about Command & Conquer was dead. It was sold to a bunch of fucking ghouls. up a little bit. I started with for the shield because it needs some broader blending on it. Do you like sexy battle mix, sexy streamers, and sexy Solaris cheerleaders? I do. Well, Thunderhead Stream has some of those things. Some. And more. And more hold me back? You can only get so excited. Thin that a little bit more. It wound up a little more opaque than I had strictly intended. Uh, I should have reactivated the oils on this shield before I started doing this, but that's okay. That's okay. I can just grab a touch of Terra Rosa and come back in. Should have just finished it all in one session, but I didn't, so no big deal. Mm, 
just a touch of Terra Rosa to save the day. No big deal. Let me just freshen this up slightly. Here we go. So we don't wind up with a transition quite so abrupt on the next one. See, this is, this is really a good demonstrative piece as far as why I do the pre-glaze and why you should do a little bit of time to reactivate your coats before you start painting. Is your, this, is, this is what it looks like when you're putting oils in a layer down on top of other paints, and I've got to do some extra blending to make sense of it. But if you pre-glaze, then you're just mixing the same layer. And you don't wind up with those harsh transitions. Touch of sienna and freshen up the edges. Thankfully, when you're only using two to three colors, it is not difficult to fix. Will your plastic glue run out before you finish the final model in the box? I'm betting no, Lore Friendly. I'm going with no. You will have enough. I believe in you, I believe in your plastic glue. Finished Metro Exodus. Uh, I was I was lucky enough to get the good ending, despite not really knowing how easy it apparently is to wind up with a bad ending in that game. I looked it up afterwards, and I was like, "Oh my god, I was I was on the razor's edge." I'd be interested to see where the Metro series goes after this. Like I said before, I completely missed Metro Last Light. I never played it. I was a little shocked to discover in Metro Exodus that the Dark Ones aren't really a big part of the story. I think that they're in the game, or at least I'm pretty sure I saw some of them in the last level, but they're not really heavily featured. Bella knocked. Here's to you, Bella. How you doing? Ah... I remember when I started playing Red Alert 2, spammed War Miners, just mocking my friend before I sent Apocalypse and Kirov. Oh, Kirov airships. Oh, Kirov airships. They fired the imaginations of an entire generation. That and fucking Ray Wise as the President of the United States in that initial cutscene. I don't give a wooden nickel about your legacy. God, that's a great game. There were so many good actors in Red Alert 2. I mean, Udo Kier... That, that, might, that actually might have been the first place that I ever saw Udo Kier. 
and then yeah, Ray Wise. Um, like broadly speaking, in the 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 FMVs for Command and Conquer, I mean, like you know, in in, in Red Alert, not Red Alert Two, in Tiberian Sun, we had uh, Michael Bain, James Earl Jones. Picked up a number of talented actors also for uh, the Tiberian Wars for CNC3. There was that dude who was in Lost at the time who played Sawyer. Michael Ironside, Billy D. Williams. Just an amazing cast all around and, and time and time again. out a little bit. Some of these shields are going to be slightly lighter than others, but I guess that's okay. I'm going to be doing some scratches on them after the fact. Also, lore friendly with 12 months of subscriptions. Look what just popped up. Can't believe I've paid all this money and still haven't gotten a more photogenic actor for the camera. Yeah, we haven't been able to afford a better avatar yet. We, we put all our money into audio gear. And, and all we can afford to represent the uh, creative conglomerate that is Thunderhead is th this, this asshole. Lore Friendly, thank you so much for the support, man. It is always wonderful to see you in chat and posting to the Storm Report. And, and y'all's subscriptions really do mean the world. They just they, 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 keep, they keep this part of Thunderhead Studio going, and I really appreciate it. First place you saw Udo Kier was Johnny Mnemonic. See, I think that it's it's very possible that I saw Udo Kier prior to Red Alert 2, but I didn't like notice Udo Kier specifically until he was uh, playing Yuri. White Wolf, I am drinking. A, I'll, I'll check the brand in a minute. I'm gonna have to go get the bottle, but it is a Belgian Golden Ale that I'm enjoying. Picked it up at the Fancy Booze Mart. Oh, Wombat Combat. Yeah, Wombat Combat knew the me before this. Wombat Combat knew me as the guy who would just kind of lounge around the friendly local game shop waiting for some young child to profess that he actually enjoys the Star Wars prequels so I could go over and tell him and his very uncomfortable looking parents why he was wrong. I was a pretty likable guy back then. <laughs> <laughs> ready to ready to blame people for the downfall of my fandom even though they had no idea who I was and they're wondering why I was talking to them man I helped them not sell so many models I didn't really do that guys come on does that really sound like me Look, it wasn't over Spider-Man, okay? It was over talking in the theater. Was it at Spider-Man? Yes. Was it over Spider-Man? No. Let's be accurate. And that was also, like, 20 years ago. That kid is probably a grown man now. And you know what, Hathrier? Do, do you suppose he talks in the theater? Or do you suppose he has, like, a deep-seated childhood memory of the time that one teenager fucking, like, made him cry in the movies, and now he's very self-conscious about being polite? I think I did everyone a favor on that day. Oh, I've come so far indeed. Now I just have a captive audience. <laughs> I would if, if you couldn't leave, but I think you can. I haven't 
I haven't quite cemented my negotiations with Twitch to actually lock your browser into the stream yet, so I think technically you can still leave, but, you know, we'll see about that. Ranting Ronin. <laughs> That's a good description. Yes, a nerd without a cause. and quick moving from one step to the other because damn it if this paint method isn't quick I'm going to abandon it I'm painting a rank and flank army for god's sake I just don't have that much time to spend on it he's in therapy yeah I see him like like that scene in Crank 2 when Glenn Howerton is in therapy talking about his experiences in the first movie and then a random bullet fired from like two blocks away ricochets off the inside of the therapist's office and hit him in the head. That guy's gonna be at a movie theater one day. And he'll lean over and very quietly whisper something to his friend and I'll be like, You motherfucker! I'll be like, it's the same guy. How is it even possible? It's true. Project Dark Fox can leave anytime he wants. Thankfully, so far, hasn't wanted to. Gotta be doing something right, but God knows what it is. arms. I can say, in all honesty, that I do want to pay you money, Project Dark Fox. God damn, I dream, I dream of being successful enough that I can afford to pseudo-employ some of my artist friends. That would make me so damn happy. Even just on a reasonable commission basis. Spread some of that love around. Y'all have made it so, so easy on me. Well, what do you want from me, White Wolf? I only have like four real opinions and the rest are all stolen from Reddit. They're gonna bring CNC back to shoot the old stuff. Yeah, like nobody liked CNC four. Nobody liked CNC four. Yeah, honestly, anyone here in chat have anything good to say about Command and Conquer four? Like really? And I don't mean like uh, it's not really that bad if you give it a chance. I mean like someone who genuinely played it after playing the previous games and enjoyed the changes that they made. Because that game was a piece of shit. It had it had nothing to do with the previous incarnations. And then the ending was like, ah, Kane was an alien the whole time, which is like one of the dumbest twists. Just a, just a terrible twist. Was that even the ending? I think that that was in the beginning of it. I 
Um, Forest Compliment for Command & Conquer 4. It put a dying series out of its misery relatively quickly. That's the best I've got for you to square. It, it, it did not linger too much longer, and it was a mercy. That's what I got. Electronic Arts is um, a terrible company who does terrible, terrible things. And it really is like they buy... Like, they have the most cynical approach possible to making games. And right now, people are all excited because they're going to release that that redux of Dead Space. And I understand being excited about it. It's probably going to be quite cool. But I think it's important to understand the full context of it coming into being and to recognize the fact that EA is not taking any risks on this. They could have done this a long time. They could have done this before Dead Space uh, fucking died and they killed Visceral Games. They could have done it before they forced Dead Space 3 to be an absolute failure. But they waited. They waited for Capcom to do their Resident Evil 2 remake and for that to be a success. And only after the numbers proved that, hey, we can do this and make money, when there was no risk associated with it, were they finally willing to actually make it. And I don't think that behavior deserves any sort of reward. I don't think that that deserves any sort of recognition. It's It's pathetic. It's disgusting. We're in a weird place right now where so much nerdy fandom... Like, cause, I mean, really think about it. These things that are cool to be into now, your Star Wars and your Star Treks and your, your Mass Effects and, and your this and your that, like, not that long ago, being into these things and publicly confessing it was you'd be the subject of ridicule from a lot of peer groups. Even as an adult. People would, would laugh at you for being a serious fan of these properties. And then we all kind of grew up and we started making money. And then companies realized, oh, there's money to be made. And now they've kind of gotten on board. But are we getting better art now? Are we getting better versions of any of this? Fuck no. We're getting more watered down, sanitized, safe versions of everything. It's, it's such a double-edged sword. When we were younger, we all wanted the money to make these things mainstream, and now realizing that mainstream often means contentless, meaningless, depressing, empty, hollow, cruel, even. Forgetting the remaster of Mass Effect made them a good amount of money, I don't think they would have even done that if, if Capcom hadn't led the way. I don't even particularly like Capcom as a company, but at least they tried something relatively fresh with Resident Evil 2. Ironically, since it's, you know, a remake. But everyone liked Resident Evil 2, and it was it was getting so dated that it was hard to play. They were like, let's update that. Let's, let's put a fresh coat of paint on it, update the gameplay to something a bit more modern. And I think it worked out wonderfully. I mean, I don't have to think it worked out wonderfully. It did. They made a bunch of money on it. Many of our favorite franchises right now, guys, are victims of their own recent success. And this mostly comes up because I'm thinking about Command and & Conquer and Dead Space, and I just... Like, we're never gonna get a Dead Space 4, or if we do get a Dead Space 4, it will have nothing to do with the original creators of Dead Space. Not one damn thing. And that's depressing. In my opinion, should you upgrade your painting tools and get your planned miniature purchases bought or focus on getting your camera rig upgraded, try to squeeze paint time out of what you've got, which is plenty. I would focus on, on squeezing time out of what you got. Now, I say this as someone who indulges in retail therapy on a regular basis. I love buying things. I love buying new kit just for the sake of having it and playing with it. 
but I think objectively the better decision is to make the best use of what you have right now and buy new things as you absolutely and truly need them. Gus Schultz, how you doing today, man? It's good to see you. Live space. That doesn't sound like a very entertaining series, I have to be honest. It's just, it's just space. You're just talking about regular old space. this song every time I hear the lyrics like I have to stop my eyes from rolling <laughs> who's, who's writing this crap maybe it's time we gave Ethan a chance it's just like 13 year old me wrote the lyrics to this song Mildly incapacitated space. Unconscious space. Again, somehow just doesn't sound as entertaining. Quick highlights on here. Right there. Right there. Not too much. Not too much. I didn't really do the gloves. That's okay. He's going in a big group. I'm not going to worry too much about it. Kind of break. I'm still doing it. I'm still falling into the habit because of how I think about painting. I taught myself to think about painting, painting acrylics, and so I still think like, all right, let's go to the next transition layer. And it's just not necessary with oils. Gradually, I'll break myself of it. I'm not going to bother going back and, and redoing anything in particular that I that I do that with. But I'm going to try to do better as I keep moving forward.
fresh too than that. Have you not seen that band name before, Wombat Combat? Occam's Laser? Yeah. That's, that, that is a solid band name, I agree. Happy Man O Coral, we got a lot of resubs coming in today. We must be hitting one of them anniversaries. 18 months for O Coral, a full year and a half. You've wasted so much time. Jeez, don't even get me started. Don't even get me started. Because I'll go all night and everyone will be depressed by the end. I don't think that's what people come here for, for the most part. Colonel Matthew Steiner. 15 whole months. Steiner, how you doing today, man? Colonel Matthew Steiner. Here Steiner's... at Thunderhead Studio, we specialize in turning your shame into... More shame. And we're real good at it. Colonel Matthew Steiner is one of those painters whose Instagram feed makes me super self-conscious just because, man, he's always churning out something. He's always got some fresh new photos of something awesome he's been working on. Always inspirational. How you doing today, Matthew Steiner? Working on Metal Iron Wind Metals Republic mechs, so a little crotchety. Oh, for the love of God, man. Stop it. <laughs> stop, stop working on metal mechs. If everyone were to stop, if everyone were to lay off, maybe we could convince them to move the fuck on. Well, it seems unlikely. They're gonna they're gonna keep making metal minis. Apparently in perpetuity. Nope, let's not let's not have a hair on there. Let's get that off. Iron Wind has some good products, just, uh... They, they're, they, they're a company that is rapidly fading into the past, it seems like. Not as rapidly as I might technically like. Now, Iron Wind does figures for a number of other games, don't they? What do they do besides Battletech? Because I don't even think like, Battletech's not even really their, their main bread and butter. Well, that sounds like a damn fine morning, Mafik. You enjoy that. What is going on with my thumb today? God, it's giving me trouble. It keeps cramping. Ouch. It hurts. Ivory black, and we can get to work on this armor. Oh, Coral, I have two projects to finish before I can get back to Battletech, and I am endeavoring to really work on projects till they're done right now. I have to finish up my Conquest Force, I need to finish up my Warcaster upgrade, and then it's going to be back into Battletech for me. Oh no, I know, Pickle Juice is, is full of electrolytes, and it's, it's fantastic for that sort of... For, for cramps and such, but I don't really know what's going on with my thumb. This is it's an unusual one. I mean, it feels like a cramp, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure why it would be. Taking some ivory black that I'm going to lay in here and let kind of glaze. Ah, it hurts though.
Oop, that might have been a bit much. Let's take it easy. Now, I didn't do anything to my thumb that I can remember, Data Nerd. It's just acting up suddenly for whatever stupid reason. Dave's Mini Art. A very, very good evening to you as well. How you doing today, Dave? Did I stretch before painting? I stretched, like, my back. And my arm muscles and my shoulders like I usually do. I don't really do, like, hand exercises, though. Maybe I should. I am getting older. You know, everything, everything on the human body has a bit of an expiration date on it. No place in particular, Dave. <laughs> I wish that I had done something with my thumb so I could go, hey, this is what's going on with it, but at the moment I'm just like, ah, oh, what do you know, my thumb hurts for no reason. Not all the time, either. Like, it's fine right now, and it will be for a little while, and then suddenly it's gonna flare up and just hurt like a son of a bitch. Hurt like a thumb of a bitch, if you will. Waffles, good to see you. I wish it was overuse because, again, I'd be like, oh, I've been doing such and such with my thumb and now it's aching and cramping, but I haven't been. I haven't done anything special with my thumb. Not that I haven't done with the whole rest of my hand. Yeah, maybe I should. Maybe I should, Grandpa's Thump. It's, uh... I'm, I'm using my hands for fine work regularly enough that I feel like even if I'm not having active problems, some hand stretches are probably just a good idea. One of those it-can't-hurt kind of suggestions. What kind of musician are you slash were you, Thump? Out of curiosity. Not that I'd know anything about it. I'm about as, as musically inclined as a box of rocks being dropped down a set of stairs. But, uh... I certainly do admire musicians, even if I have no real musical talent of my own. I can sing a little bit. I have done that. I've been uh, a handful of musical musical stage productions over the course of my life, though I haven't been for over a decade now. Okay, so so a, a working musician, as it were. Uh, 
trim down a little bit more of my black. Yeah, that's that's what I mean. Less of a uh, occasional artistic contribution and more of a okay, boys, what are we playing today? Kind of musician. That's pretty awesome. Good pay, no tour headaches. Yeah, I'd imagine it's much. It'd be much more like a job that lets you get that creative outlet out there and not having to be like a full top to bottom album artist or having to particularly sell yourself so much as your work which seems nice too much drama yeah I can imagine That many artistic people all in one place, all of them with a mind towards getting famous. That's always going to be a bit of a challenge. I think I will do that. Look up some just hand stretches and exercises and start doing that before stream time kicks up. It's, it's, like I said, it's just, even if I don't really need it, it can't hurt anything. All it can do is prolong the use of my hands. And I would, man, I would hate to lose the use of my hands. I sometimes have that thought. I'm sure we all do. And, and uh, apologies to anyone in chat who might be uh, disabled in the way that I am going to describe, but, you know, those of us who are fully able-bodied periodically have thoughts like, what if I had, what if I lost a limb? <laughs> like, how would my life change? Oh, God. I would so much rather lose a leg than an arm or a hand. So much rather. I can't, I can't really imagine having to adapt to my life without one of my hands. And yet, sometimes life will do that to you. So it's good to take care of what you got. Yeah, even just losing the use of it is bad enough, Data Nerd. Functionally the same. Hell, potentially worse to still have it, but just not be able to use it. Still got my hand, but it don't do nothing. Ugh. There but by the grace of God go I. I'm a lucky, lucky man so far. It's not even like I haven't done stupid things that could have lost me the use of limbs. I absolutely have. I've just been quite lucky throughout my life. Jack at Clubs is a d disabled veteran and a successful painter slash streamer. I'm 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 grateful to be a disabled veteran who is not disabled in that particular way. Holy crap! Too many of my friends lost entire pieces of themselves. Me, I just lost the use of some of my internal organs for the most part at least lost full functionality of them, which is also a pain in the ass. It is, you know, we, we do at least live in a world now, in 2021, that is more accepting of and friendly to disabled people in general and that is that is so damn inspirational because just a few generations ago it would be possible to be born into a world that just didn't give a shit and god would that be a terrible feeling and so many people had to endure it but there are so many ways that you can make up for it now and there are so many companies 
that that produce. I mean, even our prosthetic technology is, is amazing these days. Hmm. Mm, that's terrible, data nerd. But then you've gone through some shit medically, is my understanding. You have my my utmost sympathy as someone who uh, know no problems even remotely comparable to some of the ones I know you've suffered through. But broadly speaking, I, I have some idea what it's like to have your body just kind of be like, nah, this, this part of you just doesn't work now. Well before I broke myself off for the government, I had a series of uh, organ failures that didn't really have a reason. It was just like, ah, it, just, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. I mean, on the plus side, most of the, the broadly useless organs in my chest cavity have been removed at this point. <laughs> or my body cavity, rather. So, you know, uh, I'm good to travel. I'm not going to get appendicitis. My gallbladder ain't going to go bad. I'm never going to have a tonsil infection because they're gone. I want an AI robot arm that I can yell at, like the one Tony Stark had in the first Iron Man. That's, that's just having a robot. And yeah, that would be pretty awesome. Bonus points if it can make sad, disappointed sounds when you yell at it, like that one did. It's been so long since that first Iron Man movie came out, you guys, and it's kind of hard to imagine. We live in a completely different world than that one. A walking tragedy, Roland. Keep up, we might be able to print replacement parts for those problems. Ooh, now that would be an exciting future, wouldn't it? Getting closer every day as the technology gets better and more accessible. That's the great thing about, like, 3D printing right now is capable of so much more than we really give it credit for. The question is putting it in the hands of the people who are going to create those, those designs that are really going to blow all of our minds. Increasing the accessibility increases the likelihood of that. Iron Man 1 was the last superhero movie you ever saw? Jesus, PDF, you've been living under a rock, man. Yeah, you're only you're only about 20 years of movies behind. No big deal. Well, I mean, less than that, but still, a lot. Yeah, you're really, you know, honestly, having watched most to all of them, you're not really missing much. At this point, my advice would be just, like, don't even get involved. Just just leave it be. It's not worth the time or the effort. Discovered a fun fact. What's what's that, Roland? What's our fun fact for the day? What's with the black paint, uh, Project Dark Fox? I'm just using this as a base. For my metallic parts, I have all warm tones on here. Ivory black has a nice cool component to it, and these are all going to be metal. So this is basically just a cool black base. And I'm going to build up some, some quick highlights on it using Payne's gray and white. Leaving a couple of warm tones in the shadows.
one of the writers of Robot Jocks was Battletech author, author Robert Thurston under a pen name. I don't find that surprising. There isn't enough man piloting giant robot fiction out there that the pool of people working on it could be that deep, you know? It's, it's always been a fairly small community of people who are into the idea so much that they're really willing to write about it. Which I find surprising because I'm like super duper into it, but over the course of my life I've realized that not that many people are because we just don't get that many entries. House just shook. Oh god, I hope everything's okay over there. Yeah, don't, don't, like, you know, we were just talking about giant robots. If you got, like, a kaiju situation, dude, just get the fuck out. Just go. If this is the beginning of the alien invasion, though, please do come back and let us know, because I think based on your location, I would still have some time. And I'd love to have that early warning. Save the minis first. Women and miniatures first. Screw the children. Oh my god, did you guys see that? Like, do you think we're gonna get an XCOM 3 at this point? Like, they just quietly released a really shitty Marvel Strike Force style XCOM game for mobile, and it's just like. Is XCOM just dead at this point? I really hope it isn't. Ugh. Mobile XCOM. Who the hell wants that? It doesn't make any sense. Those games are built around recognizable IP with specific characters that you want to collect. That's why it works for Star Wars and Marvel. Because you're like, you, know, you want to collect the latest Black Widow because the Black Widow movie just came out. You want to collect the latest character. You want to get all the different versions of Wolverine, what have you. There are barely any named characters in XCOM. What are you going to do? Collect nameless soldiers 1 through 397? I struggle to think of a property that makes less sense to adapt to that style of gameplay. Right, I'm going to set this, this green group down, and I'm going to do the same thing I just did to them to the reds. Spirit here, thin down my black. Yeah, looks about right. Oop, oh, that's way too thin. Let's get some more black in there. Whoopsies. That's better. Maybe did that a little bit. That's okay though. We'll live. Still hesitantly hopeful we will have, based on the assumption that Chimera Squad was... I liked Chimera Squad. 
I really liked Chimera Squad. I, I would love to see some of the features from Chimera Squad get implemented into a proper XCOM 3. And I'll tell you what, I would like it if XCOM 3 took some cues from XCOM Apocalypse. All, like, all the sequels to the original XCOM have been kind of weird, but I mean, XCOM Apocalypse was the last time I feel like they really tried something new. Terror from the Deep was just more of the same, but now there's, like, squid monsters and, and, and octopus brains and parasites and shit. Whereas, XCOM Apocalypse was actually pretty fresh. Admittedly, I don't want it to be real-time, even on the overworld like Apocalypse was, but the idea of it being set in a mega city was really cool. Ooh, what'd you figure out, Kursala? Thunderhead likes something that's widely disliked. I know, right? That never happens. That's almost as rare as me disliking something that's popular just because it's popular. I don't think it's unfair. I really don't think it's unfair to consider the fandom of popular things in, in the consideration of whether you like that thing or not. I don't think it's unfair. Not in this world that we live in where the fandom is such a, a visible, real, everyday component of everything pop culture. used to be you could ignore the fans of something and just appreciate it for what it was, but in, in 2021, that's not really a thing. I'll, te I'll tease you right back, Wombat Combat. We don't, we, don't, we don't put up with that crap here. Teasing me in my chat? Nobody does that. Was Chimera Squad widely disliked? I thought a lot of people liked it. Yeah, I mean, Terror from the Deep, it came out very quickly, and it was obvious, because it was the same fucking game with a couple of units added, and it was like, oh, you can go in the ocean now. And a really hastily tacked-together storyline that didn't actually make a lot of sense, in my opinion. Now, don't get me wrong, if they did an XCOM 3 and just rehashed Terror from the Deep and expanded on the ideas of it, I'd be down with that, too. But based on their whole, like, War of the Ancients or the Eternals or whatever it's called, I feel like they're really kind of trying to go in their own direction. It, it felt like half a game. It, it felt like less than half a game. Chimera Squad felt like a third of a game, or maybe just as a proof of concept for ideas for XCOM 3, but stuff like the breaching mechanic, I would love to see that implemented with XCOM 3. And I got a lot of influence from XCOM Apocalypse in XCOM Chimera Squad. It had the same general idea of a setting. You're in, like, a big human city moving around, responding to problems in, in buildings and stuff, as opposed to flying around the whole world and having fights in random fields. It felt like a treat, a, a re-visitation of Apocalypse, and I really liked that. If I checked out Phoenix Point. Um, so I got Phoenix Point, like, I pre-ordered Phoenix Point. And I played it at release, and it was such a broken, unbelievable piece of shit. Uh, that I just sealed it behind a brick wall in my house and have not revisited it. Uh, I should probably go back and see what they've changed. It definitely seemed like a game that was up my alley. I, I love that style of gameplay. But, yeah, the initial release was bonkers. Absolutely fucking bonkers. The number of times I, I'm like, oh, I'm on a mission. Okay, let me fire this grenade over this wall. And you fire the grenade and it bounces off the wall back into you and kills you. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to wait. I'm just going to wait. But at this point, I may have waited long enough. I don't know.
Didn't like the meteor extinction of the dinosaurs being actually caused by an alien ship crash. I didn't get far enough into the story to give a shit about any of it. I was, I was completely turned off by the broken state of the gameplay. Uh, Phoenix Point Crossbow Roof. How you doing, man? Currently trying out Baldur's Gert. Baldur's Gert. Baldur's Gert. Baldur's Gate 3 in early access. I'm waiting on that one to leave early access. I've heard good things about the early access, but I'm like, you know, I've waited this long since Baldur's Gate 2. Since... Since the joys of, of John Irenicus. Um... I'm gonna wait for it to be a fully released game before I touch it. I'm, I'm kind of sick of early access at this point. Like, I've bought into enough games where it's like, ah, oh, it's playable, though. It's playable. The only game I can remember in the last while that I got an early access that hasn't burned me in any way has been, like, Satisfactory. And that's just because it gives me a chance to master each tier of technology before they release the next one. And that's a logistics game, like... Eventually, they're going to implement some of the more advanced features, but what it has is so good that I just don't care. I'm not playing it for the story. Riot Sister, how are you doing tonight? Hello there. Always a pleasure to see you. And Factorio before it. I still go back to Factorio periodically. I've never, I've never launched a rocket in Factorio. I just, I never get that far with my factories. And then if I stop playing Factorio for a while, I have to go back and start over. Because trying to analyze my own fucking spaghetti when I've forgotten what each part of the factory does is just pointless. It's not like I put up signs or build things in a way that's logical enough for you to figure it out just by examining it. That's crazy talk. about Star Sector. I still haven't dug into it. I have not dug into Star Sector. I got it when Chaotic Harmony was talking about it, and I just kind of... There's another one where I'm like, I'm just going to leave this for a little while and see what it turns into. I don't have that much patience for video games these days, guys. Like, I'm getting old or something. I don't know. I find myself very, very attracted to simple games that I can pick up and play for like a half an hour and drop. Or it, it's like this this all or nothing kind of thing. Either a game that is going to consume the next 12 hours of my life before I know what's going on, or a game that I can pick up, play for 20 minutes, drop, and never think about again. Nothing in between. Not on purpose, mind you, it's just what's happened to me. Just woke up getting dinner started. Oh. Late night, I take it, huh? Late night or early morning, one of the two. Yeah, we do need to jump back into some Monster Hunter for God Arung. That That is kind of precisely in that zone of a game that I can pick up, run a few missions, and then move the hell out. I played Stardew Valley for a while, and then I got started on a game similar to it called Graveyard Keeper that's much more morbid, where you, like, embalm bodies and bury people and turn people's loved ones into zombies that you then make slaves in your lumber camps. It's not as polished as Stardew Valley, but... And here's the thing, like, I'm not saying anything bad about Stardew Valley. Stardew Valley is a fan-fucking-tastic game. It's just real fucking cutesy, and I'm like, eh, it just, I don't know, it doesn't, doesn't really grab me. Not that it's bad, just that it doesn't personally appeal to me all that much. Oh, I love Rim. RimWorld is, yeah, that that's the dangerous end of the spectrum, Wombat Combat. Because I'll fire up RimWorld, and I'll lose four fucking days to it. I'll just go and go and go and go and go. Your 
touch more black. There we go. Should be enough for a while, really. It sounds like the fucking theme man to, or theme tune to Running Man, or not theme tune, but it sounds like it's off the Running Man soundtrack. I haven't played the Ideology. Like, I only recently played the, um, Royalty expansion, which came out a while ago. But I'm very curious about the Ideology expansion. There's so many mods for RimWorld that I just don't get, like, that riled up about the expansions, because it's like, almost anything you're gonna get in a mod, or in an expansion, someone's already modded in someplace. Still, official ones are nice. I almost always play with some mods for a few things, like, uh couple extra buildings for defense like embrasures and stuff and I'll usually do whatever mod it is that prevents people from doing drop pot assaults inside your base because that's fucking nonsense and the fact that there's no way to prevent it in vanilla is just crazy Shinoda Beast how are you doing it's been a while please feel free to lurk I love my lurkers I hope you're doing well Think of letting Tiny Hands play RimWorld for a few minutes. Yeah. There's no fucking such thing. You can't do anything in a few minutes of RimWorld, so anytime you sit down to it, that turns into at least two hours. And then by the time you sunk in two hours, you're like, well, I'm not doing anything else, so let's do this for another six hours. And this is a dangerous and slippery slope to find yourself on for anyone. Like I said, that's how I play games for whatever reason. Like, I just beat Metro Exodus, and it was like, could I have dragged out playing that game over a few weeks? Sure. Instead, I was like, let me just take two days and do nothing but this. I don't know. It's over. I beat it. I don't feel the urge to go back to it. That's a good thing. But I could have had a more productive previous two days, I can tell you that. Pun expected. How are you doing tonight, my friend? Guys, if you're not following Pun Expected Painting, is another fantastic member of the painting community here on Twitch. I am honored to consider myself a part of. You should definitely go drop a follow for. Up to pun expected. What you, what you, what you working on there? Pez Motion, you have a fantastic dinner. It's always a pleasure to see you, man. Thank you so much for stopping in. three and those four all done up in exactly the same way. Let me make sure I didn't miss anything. I am going to take a short break. Get up, stretch my legs, grab something to drink, let this paint sit for just a minute so that I can do some blending on it. I'll be right back with some, with some fresh brew 
and we'll get to work on this metal and see what we can get done in the next hour or 15 minutes or so before the storm report kicks off. Ladies and gentlemen, locusts and gentlemen, don't touch that dial. I'll see you in just a minute.
No, not coffee this time. <sighs> not feeling quite that run down today. This is a... How you pronounce that? Bokrix, I'm assuming. Or there's a ya in there that I'm not doing right. I just kind of grabbed it off the shelf when I was getting my sours and thought, ah, I'll give this a shot. If I said I didn't love collecting stoneware bottles, they're just so cool. It's pronounced Quaka. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, that makes total sense. Both of these. What's up, sluts? How you doing, Puck Duncher? It's good to see you. How are things? We don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't get enough. We don't get enough Puck Duncher around these parts these days. Alright, that black should have settled in nicely now, so I'm going to go back to the green guys. Let's start trying to work up a couple of quick and easy metal highlights. I just had it on, on the screen, Riot Sister. It is this Belgian Golden Ale. I believe it's pronounced drink, motherfucker! Yeah, that makes sense. Many thanks to my chat for always keeping me just a little tipsy during my stream. Just a little. Oh, there's a little spot on here I missed. Let me go ahead and get that real quick. Oh, two spots. I didn't get any of the metal on the belt. That's okay. It's easily corrected. actually tried this. This is this is my first time getting an ale of this particular brand, but generally when I go to the fancy liquor store, I just wander around until something catches my eye and, and, and get it. And every now and then you stumble onto something pretty tasty that way. We are all lamer on this blessed day. Deep man, that's deep. Philosophically, who's lamer? We're all lamer.
There was a little note of Ghostbusters in there at the end. Wasn't there? Did anybody else hear that? There was just a little... And then the song ends. I heard it. I heard it. I'm on to you, whoever that band was. some of these details on the bases since they're nice and sculpted in. Guess who bought two high elf halves of the 2010 Island of Blood box for Warhammer Fantasy Battles? Your neighbor. Uh, your great aunt. Am I close? So yeah, what is going on with Warhammer Fantasy anyway? Like I said last time, like I caught the news that they were doing sort of a specialty revival of it, but I guess the details are pretty scant online. Great, great Grammy. That's why it's the elves. I was there, Gandalf. I was there 3,000 years ago. Trying to recapture some of her childhood. The scoop is it will release some new codex, wait a year, and abandon it. Oh, so pretty pretty standard fare for Games Workshop specialty games then. <laughs> We'll get you fired up, we'll sell a couple of box sets, and we will never support it. Not one goddamn time. I can't, I'm like, yeah, that's, that's what I figure they're gonna do. Age of Sigmar is like their bread and butter at this point. Why would they even bother? Like, they killed the game once. They're obviously not looking to really bring it back, just to profit a little bit off what nostalgia lingers. Get some Payne's Gray in here, and let's start highlighting. These are square bases. is compatible with old Warhammer Fantasy Battles minis. Uh, that's cool. I, I, I mean, I guess. I wish that they had just kept the game. Maybe they are looking at Conquest and thinking like, Oh my god, there is a market for that style of game after all. Why did we stop making it? Hey, Mars to Pants, good to see you. It's a weird gaming community in San Antonio, Wombat. And, uh... Games Workshop has such a weird hold on the collective mind of the tabletop gaming community. I've observed what you're saying to a degree that people, like, refuse to take any game seriously that isn't Warhammer Fantasy, but there are better rank and flank games out there. We got Rune Wars going pretty good in San Antonio, and it would have kept going if FFG hadn't fucking killed the game, hadn't sacrificed their own IP on a Mickey Mouse-shaped altar. God damn them. That was such bullshit. gray here. I'm going to mix in a touch of white. Get myself a nice light bluish gray. And we can start working this in. Just kind of broad and sloppy. No big deal.
Painting Sloppy gets more models painted. Here at Thunderhead Studios, it's okay to be sloppy. Bonus points if it's white paint. It's the way we like it, baby. I need a touch more blue. I'm gonna mix in a little bit of Prussian blue, and it's just gonna take the fuck over, apparently, because that's what Prussian blue does. Let's saturate that a bit. Prussian blue really is just, it's a bully of a color. It is both opaque and aggressive. The Song of Ice and Fire game seems interesting. Know anything about it? I played a few games of A Song of Ice and Fire. Uh, it's really quite good. I, Roland, I don't know that it is the best rank and flank game in print right now. It's definitely excellent. Conquest is a great game, though. Before Conquest came out, I would agree that A Song of Ice and Fire was the best rank and flank game in print. After Rune Wars died, it certainly took that. Um, but Conquest is also pretty excellent. Look, I'm not saying Thunderhead's trying to brush you off. But you're just base coat, man. I think that the, the Song of Ice and Fire would almost do better if it weren't a Song of Ice and Fire. Like, if it was just that, the game system as it exists right now, attached to any other IP. I'll be the first to acknowledge that it's one of the things that keeps me from getting into it, is I can't even think about a Song of Ice and Fire without getting kind of bitter about everything that happened. You know what I'm talking about. It's sad that such a good series is, in a weird way, kind of poisoned by the entirety of Season 8 of an HBO series based on it. But it is. That and the fact that I don't think George Martin's never finishing that series. At this point, that is, that is greater fantasy than the notion of riding fucking dragons, okay? He fully intends to drag that out as long as he can, make as much money as he can, and then die before anyone can hold him to it. gonna pull a Robert Jordan but on purpose oh it is yeah no the that's the thing the the game doesn't really have anything to do with the show it, it doesn't borrow anything from the show it, it every like the game is very clearly based on the books heavily which works to its favor all things considered if you're curious about a Puck Duncher, I would try it. If you can find someone locally who plays it, like, go try to get a game. It's it's an excellent game. I think Roland is absolutely correct. It is it is very simple to play, but tactically surprisingly deep once you get into it. Say it's entirely poisoned by George R. R. Martin. Yeah, I... We gave George Martin too much money too quickly. We didn't make him finish his product to get famous and to get money. We let him sell us an entire franchise based on a half of a franchise. And now he's never, ever going to finish it. Why would he? Why should he? 
We're gonna, people will give him money for starting new projects in the middle of the project that he hasn't finished. He's like, if I became rich and famous, I wouldn't finish anything either. I would also be a massive disappointment. He's just luckier than I am. <laughs> and, you know, infinitely more talented, but that's beside the point. Oh yeah, Roland, and the, the... Excuse me, my nose is itching. There's like a political sub-game. Which I think is pretty cool, because there's a lot of non-combat characters, and you position them in places on the board where they're influencing events outside of battle. Petitioning people, or sending messages, or this, that, and the other thing. And it actually has a surprisingly deep... Um, like, you can do a lot using the non-combat characters. So, you know, you can run like Cersei Lannister. She's not going to get out on the field and fight anybody, but she'll be working behind the scenes, you know? And the miniatures are very, very nice as well. They did a, Cool Mini or Not, did a very, very good job on the minis. I don't necessarily love the fact that every single unit is precisely the same size and shape. I feel like they could have done more with that, but that's a real minor complaint in the grand scheme of things. It's the kind of game where the qualities of it are not immediately obvious until you start playing it, and then they start jumping out at you. So like I said, if you have the opportunity to play it, I would get in a demo with somebody, because I think it'll sell itself. There's some games you have to sell outside of the game, and there's some games that are so well put together that just playing them sells them to you. It's, it's, uh, it's one of the latter. Wouldn't Cersei just get wine drunk and dress like a TNG Romulan? <laughs> she kind of did, didn't she? Like shoulder pads, ridiculous, fucking uh, <laughs> crazy ass patterns. Romulans, man, Romulans. I'm glad that most of the actors emerged from that show pretty much unscathed. Like, we weren't so kind to the Star Wars actors, like poor Jake Lloyd, but I mean, nobody blames uh, Lena Headey for what happened in the show. Which is good. She's got nothing but fame for it, and she deserves it. She's a great actress. Of course, I liked Lena Headey before it was cool back when Dread 2013 came out, but nobody paid attention to that movie. if I can gatekeep your fandom for a moment. I didn't see... Gunpowder Milkshake is on Netflix right now, isn't it? Is it any good? I will say, like, okay, let, let's say some positive things. Kursala, I didn't just read those two words next to each other. I did not just read those two words next to each other. That, that, that didn't happen. I'm going to give you the chance to recover from that one.
Bad choreography. Oh no, that kind of kills it though, in a movie that's supposed to be about people shooting fools. The least you can do is have good choreography. John Wick kind of set the standard, right? I'll accept that, just because that doesn't make me, like, actively want to have an aneurysm. Kursala Dread is a fucking amazing movie, and even in the context of just drawing attention to Lena Headey's other work, you, you dare not say such things. Still irritates me that Dread didn't do better in theaters. Yeah, we, we could have gotten, like, some pretty excellent sequels, and we just never will now. None of the Dread continuation projects have ever taken off. And that's a tragedy. We had Alex Garland working on that shit. He's gone on to do a series of really excellent movies on his own. Is anyone paying any attention to this? There's an MMO right now being developed by Amazon, I think, called New World. Is anyone paying any attention to this? Can anyone tell me anything about it? Steam is trying to... Steam seems to think that I, I would want it when it comes out. But I don't really know anything about it, except that it's an MMO, which immediately makes me go, Egh. and Amazon's developing it, which... They're just, they're just gonna make everything, I guess. They're branching out into literally every market. It's in closed beta right now. And it fries your graphics card. Wow. I mean, I want to watch... I'll tell you what I want to watch, Data Nerd. I want to watch RoboCop and Dread right next to each other. Because I don't know how many of you know this. Probably a lot. Actually, maybe not. Maybe nobody's as much of a RoboCop fan as I wish they were. RoboCop was originally going to be a Judge Dread movie. And it was an issue of licensing that fell through during the writing process with Rob Neumeier. RoboCop was going to be Judge Dredd, and then in the writing process, like I said, they had a, a licensing issue that fell through with 2000 AD, and they just had to retool the script, and it became RoboCop. Which makes a lot of sense when you're familiar with both characters. Back to back with Demolition Man? Hmm. That's interesting. Stallone and Urban Dread double feature. That's not a bad idea. I don't hate 1995's Judge Dread. It's not a good movie. In fact, it, it is a bad movie. But there are parts of it that are really quite delightful. Yeah, that's right. Martial Law. Oh, man. Killing graphics cards. Watched a few minutes of gameplay. Looks like a WoW clone. Yeah, everything's a WoW clone. I agree. Um, only game in years that's actually a game. Pay some money. Get a game that works. Right? I wish we could return to that in general. I'm tired of buying fucking betas without being told that's what I'm doing. I 
I'm tired of this notion that ah, I'll fix it later. You know, why don't you fix it before you sell it to me, you bunch of clowns? How about that? I do kind of miss the game, the days when people sold us finished games. Admittedly, games were simpler back then. I don't even like have a problem with the idea of fixing problems with games in post, but it's like it's become so acceptable in the industry that now publishers plan to do it, and that's not a good paradigm at all. Like they don't bother finishing it; they just let it be broken, sell it, treat the initial pre-sales as essentially a a, a beta test and then fix it later. They don't even try anymore. I think Cyberpunk 2077 was a, a pretty... Well, to be fair, I think that what happened with Cyberpunk 2077 was more complex than that, but... It was not very consumer-oriented, that's for sure. It was very much a, eh, you figure it out. Whatever, fuck you, you'll buy it anyway. Someone in my gaming group was talking about ideal casting for a Terminator remake. Carl Urban as Kyle Reese. That's an interesting idea. Thank you for the reminder, Riot Sester. Oh, I need that every now and then. I could see Carl Urban actually doing a really good Kyle Reese. He would he would pour his heart and soul into it. I, I believe that Carl Urban is probably a Terminator fan. He's a huge fucking dork. He is a huge dork. I don't know if you guys have ever listened to the the crew commentary for the Lord of the Rings movies, the Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings movies. But it's like most of the crew commentary, most of the actor and crew commentary on that movie is always like telling little anecdotes about fun times they had on set and humorous little things that occurred here and there. And oh, this prop did that. No. Oh, yada yada. This is when Ian McKellen farted in a bag of Doritos or, or whatever the hell the story is. And then you get to Carl Urban's commentary and every single time Carl Urban chimes in, it is the dorkiest shit. I swear to God, 80% of his commentary is like, this didn't happen in the books. Like, God, shut up, Carl. You, you absolute fucking dork. You're like, of course, uh, at this point in the, uh, in the books, my character wouldn't, wouldn't have been there. He actually would have been down in the valley fighting with, with, with Aragorn when, when Gandalf showed up, but he thought it would be more dramatic if I were to ride in later, which I, I didn't really agree with, but of course I'm not, you know, I'm not a writer, so. But yeah, we get it. We get it, Carl. You read them all. I can respect it. Carl is a, he's a pro. He's a pro and he is the real deal, in my opinion. He was Vergaderung, yeah, he played Ammer. He is also the reason, apparently it was his... Um, it was... Ugh, Stephen Amell as Kyle Re Ooh. I like Stephen Amell, but I don't know about that. I don't know if he can, if he can hold that kind of a role. I'm not saying Michael Bain is a great actor, but Stephen Amell's pretty forgettable. Ammer, he's the, um, is, uh, is this guy. Nephew of the King of Rohan. He has a scene where his sword falls out of his scabbard and nobody addresses it. They're just like, move on, move on quickly. He was the, the leader of the Rohirrim, and apparently it was his influence that got the... Because there's a scene in the books, and it's called the, the, the Blood Rage 
the red rage of Aemer when he thinks that his sister Eowyn has been killed during the Battle of Pelennor when he goes into a blood rage and in the books he kills like some ridiculous number of orcs just fighting his way from his position to Eowyn. And they didn't really do that in the movie, but because he was such a, a adherent to the original source material, he has one shot in the extended cut where he pulls off his helmet and just screams his fucking head out and gets like the turbo crazy eyes. And uh, that was that was apparently because he was protesting the lack of the blood rage of Aemer. It's amazing that those movies, for as huge as they are, were kind of like, they're almost guerrilla cinema. Like, they were being written and modified as they filmed them on the ground in New Zealand. They're an amazing collaborative process. I strongly recommend anybody who hasn't watched the extended cut uh, various commentaries from cast and crew. Like, in my mind, the exist the... the those commentaries justify the existence of cast and crew commentary on film in general. I don't watch most crew commentaries for most movies, but those ones are pretty excellent. Hey, I warned you about those jalapeno poppers, okay? How's the tip of your finger doing, by the way? Thank you for tolerating the <laughs> the shitty food in in my little hick town, by the way, at <laughs> Rare. Nobody expected New Zealand to work as well as it did, though, Riot Sister. Like, the existence of the Lord of the Rings movies seems to have educated the world about the fact that New Zealand is a beautiful country with amazing landscapes. I don't think anybody knew prior to that, or if they knew, it was a pretty good, pretty well-kept secret. The Lord of the Rings movies are one of the best things to happen to the New Zealand uh, tourism board in decades. so slightly. Let's just take a touch of white spirits. There we go. use well you know uh, Motown has grown significantly more in the past 10 years than this town has there are a couple of random bristles on this brush that have been completely bent to the side I'm just going to take them off real quick Anybody. 
Neptune 2 any good? So far, so good, Buck Duncher. It has been pretty much plug and play since I've plugged it in and started playing with it. Tolkien podcast, please do Riot Sister. Just a touch more. I can't seem to get it at quite the right consistency. There we go. That's closer. this titanium white, I can only ever seem to have it too viscous or too thin, never just right. Well, this is why we practice. We keep practicing. It's called You Have My Sword, put on by a dear friend of mine. Oh, interesting. Uh, please post a link to it in the Discord. I'd love to take a look at it, or listen at it, whatever it is you do with podcasts, you know what I mean. And my axe. We should do a Judge Dredd watch party. I think that that is, a, that is an excellent suggestion, by the way, Data Nerd. We do have the polling up for this week's, for this month's, this week's also, but this month's uh, movie night, by the way. It is over in the Discord. I pinged everybody with the tag, but if you're curious, you can go ahead and uh, grab that tag in the welcome channel and check out the movie night discussion and voting channel. It's looking like we're going to wind up watching, despite the fact that I really pushed hard for Paul Verhoeven movies, like because I wanted to watch RoboCop, and maybe Total Recall, maybe Starship Troopers. It's looking like we're going to wind up watching Captain America, The First Avenger, and Independence Day. Which is fine, it's on theme. It's good to note, not everybody is as excited about Paul Verhoeven movies as I am.
was his birthday on the 18th of this month. We need more. We need more Paul Verhoeven fanatics, Colonel Matthew Steiner. There aren't enough in the world. For everything but, like, Showgirls. <laughs> like, I think we can all acknowledge that Showgirls was weird. Not particularly good. Riot Sister, whoa. I'm not gonna sit here and say that Captain America the First Avenger is like a great movie, but it's a fucking entertaining movie. Done by the same dude who directed The Rocketeer, Joe Johnston. I think The Rocketeer is a better movie. But I like Captain America the First Avenger. It's not perfect. The later Captain America movies kind of put it to shame. They are better. But it has a lot to love. Romeo Void, you have a fantastic night, my friend. Thank you for sticking around so late. Now, I agree with UG Independence Day. Like... Of all the movies that I put on that list, that was the one I was hoping would win the least. Roland Emmerich is a fucking hack. But if that's what people want to watch for July, we'll watch it. I'm going to talk shit about it literally the whole time. But we will watch it. Winter Soldier is the best MCU movie. I mean, yeah. Uh, comparing Winter Soldier to Civil War is almost a joke. Like, Civil War is fun, and it's certainly watchable, but it's an order of magnitude worse of a film than Winter Soldier. Winter Soldier is one of the only movies in the MCU that I would say, maybe not one of the only, there are a number that are pretty good, but... There aren't many movies in the MCU that I would say are good movies independent of being superhero movies. Like, most of them I would flick the qualifier on, like, it's good for a Marvel movie. But they tend to be very... They tend to be pretty flat and just entertaining and not really worthy of much examination. Um, Winter Soldier's a good movie, just by itself. It has, it has really excellent uh, writing, choreography. It has a, a fairly thrilling sort of spy plot as the main thread. It's got a fairly compelling uh, buddy drama between, you know, Bucky and Steve. It's, it's a good movie. Civil War is, is not. Civil War is, it is filler. Civil War was Civil War was born in a in a corporate fucking boardroom. People saying, "Hey, they did this in the comics. We should we should do it in the movies." And then they did it kind of poorly. I 
I'll watch the entirety of Civil War just for Ant-Man turning giant, but I can also get that in Ant-Man 2, so... like the Captain America Civil War was... No, it was an Avengers movie. It was absolutely an Avengers movie, and they just named it Captain America for some reason. And it also had, like, the weakest iteration of Baron Zemo, to the point that when they released the Falcon and the Winter Soldier and included Zemo, they had to essentially retcon everything about him to make any sense out of him. Which is not indicative of good planning. Well, Kursala, I think that, that that mostly goes without saying, but you're absolutely correct. Put the Zemo dance on the new Ratchet and Clank. <laughs> the Zemo dance is a solid meme. It is a meme that I thoroughly approve of. And obviously everyone here is super duper worried about which memes I approve of. That's, that's a metric that anyone gives a shit about, right? and we get What If. Here pretty soon we're also going to be getting uh, Suicide Squad, which I'm actually excited about. I hope that it's good. I mean, it's a James Gunn movie. It should at least be entertaining, if nothing else. Yeah, because Nathan Fillion is in it. I'm excited for it. It's got a good cast. It's got a good crew. It's got a solid premise. Um, they went way out there and just revealed early on that, that at least part of the main villain cast is going to be uh, Starro the Conqueror, which for DC fans is exciting. For non-DC fans, just prepare for absolute fucking absurdity. Starro the Conqueror is an interstellar starfish with telepathic abilities who often engages in mind control through the use of smaller starfish spores. So that should be something. Trying to establish my baseline so that I can do the metal on the rest of these guys. Trying to keep it simple. It doesn't need to look amazing. It just needs to... Be passable and easy to do. For whatever reason, my white is really just... battling me today. Let's try using a little bit thick and then using a blending brush. Let's try that. Just 
warp it on there. And come in and kind of ease the edges of it. I do not have my consistencies for oils down yet, though I continue to experiment with them. I mean, the, the, the putting the in front of it is, is both a way of making a sequel, and I don't know, Pretzel does seem a little bit loud. Let me turn it down a little bit. I'm not sure why it's... I think I touched any of the settings on it. It's a little bit easier. Um, uh, putting the in front of it, calling it the Suicide Squad, is just you know it's signaling we're we're it, it's a soft reboot, which has just come into fashion lately for whatever reason. I would personally prefer it if they could own it a bit better, just be like, look, we're rebooting Suicide Squad. Pretend the last one didn't happen, but. Somewhere along the line, they decided that that was not the best way to go about it, and now we do the soft reboots, we put the in front of it, and we pretend like it's new. Even though the continuity isn't broken. I guess it's just their way of not admitting a mistake. And the first Suicide Squad movie was very much a mistake. Everything about it was a fucking mistake, everything about it was terrible. Not everything, there were a few casting choices I liked. I liked Jai Courtney as Captain Boomerang. The problem is he didn't do anything in the first one. They put him up against threats that were like, Captain Boomerang can't fight this. Why the hell is he in the movie? And it just confused people. What the fuck is Harley Quinn with her stupid baseball bat and hammer going to do against some sort of ancient Egyptian god? Well, the answer is nothing. Those aren't the kind of threats that they usually face with the Suicide Squad. They should have tried reading the comics once or twice before making a movie about them. The recidivist rodeo, the convict carnival. <laughs> right, let's take a break from this guy and mix some blue into the next one. See where we can land. This is very thinned down, and I think that this is probably the direction I want to go, but haven't been thus far. So let's give it a shot. I really quite like the Suicide Squad comics, and I have for a long time, and it was irritating to me when that movie came out and it just had almost nothing to do with the the Suicide Squad that we knew and loved. Technically it had a lot of the characters but they were virtually unrecognizable. Deadshot in particular. God, I cannot tell you how irritating it was the fact that Deadshot in those weird intro scenes they had before the movie proper started when they're introducing each character with some little flashback they had Deadshot bounce a bullet off of like two surfaces to hit a guy that he was assassinating and those of you who've read the comics know like that's like Deadshot's thing that's like his gimmick he he shoots bullets and really really accurately and about half the time he bounces those bullets off of flat surfaces to hit secondary targets he doesn't really have a power outside of that that's his thing they have him do it one time, like acknowledging it that it's supposed to happen, and for the rest of the movie, he never does it again. Instead, they just have Will Smith periodically go, remember everybody, we're the bad guys, because as an audience, we actually needed reminding of that, since they just made him likable and not a bad guy at all. Don't even get me started on that horrible Batman inclusion scene. Oh my god.
you know me, hating popular things is my jam, but I really don't understand why people got into Ben Affleck's Batman at all. He was not, and not in one single scene did Ben Affleck's Batman do anything other than look pretty cool. He wasn't a good Batman at any point. Welcome back, Mafik. It's good to see you again, man. I am. Eagerly, Roland. I am excited for Robert Pattinson playing Batman. I'll tell you what I'm not going to do, though. If that movie comes out and Robert Pattinson plays a shitty, terrible Batman, I'm not going to just stand by it. I will be the first to admit if he if his Batman is terrible. But I don't think it will be based on everybody who's involved in production and based on Robert Pattinson's commitment to his roles. And you know, it's hard to judge the quality of anything based on a trailer. They can be so so deceptive, but the one trailer we have it, it looks really good. It looks pretty excellent. I like, I like the one scene we have of Batman just kicking the shit out of some goons in an alley that they put in the trailer. It is nasty. It is nasty. And it's not that Ben Affleck style, and then he flies through the air, and then he punches a guy in the chest so hard that he does three somersaults as he flies across the room and hammers into a brick wall like... <sighs> Maybe it's the fact that Ben Affleck's Batman played out like a video game character. Like, he, he, he looked like what things that you would do in Batman Arkham Knight, which, or, or, you know, the Arkham City games, which, okay, fine, those games are really popular, but I don't want the same thing out of a fucking video game that I want in a live-action film. I would like some plausibility, even in my superheroes, believe it or not. Captain America is, in fact, superhuman, and when he punches people in his movies, they don't fly that far. That doesn't make any damn sense. Furthermore, if you were hit that hard, hard enough to bodily project you across the room, every single thing inside of you would be ruptured. You'd just be dead. Or as the little brief bit of violence that we see. Yeah, exactly, exactly for God of Rome. The side of Batman that I need to see in a film that I have not ever seen in essentially any of the movies except a little bit of Christian Bale's Batman, who is... I think, I think it's hard to judge Christian Bale's Batman generally because it's its own thing but I want to see the world's greatest detective that's what he's supposed to be I want to see him in those detective comic storylines and Paul Dano playing the Riddler is exciting Paul Dano is a, a phenomenal actor see that's the thing Like you don't get Robert Pattinson and Paul Dano these days unless you're looking for some difficult performances Had to make him seem stronger so he could keep up with Superman. But see, see, Dor, that's that's just coming at it from the wrong angle entirely. No, I agree with you. I think you're absolutely correct because I think it's it's incorrect to say that on any level the creation of Batman versus Superman, like the the concepting of that movie is so transparent, it's painful. Somebody read The Dark Knight Returns, which is. A fine two-part graphic novel by Frank Miller. O okay, uh, you know, I I'm not gonna sit here and 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 draw the ire of the Frank Miller fanboys who definitely fucking exist out there. I'll just say that I am not personally a fan of most of the things that Frank Miller has done. Um, he has a very distinct style. I think that it is largely informed by his personal experiences. If you dig into them. I think that the that, that Frank Miller's writing is good, objectively speaking, it is it is internally consistent. But it's not what I want out of Batman. It's never what I wanted out of Batman. And I think a lot of Batman fans in fact the Dark Knight Returns is it's non canon. It's it's a it's a weird little else world side story effectively set in the future of a really, really dark version of the DC universe. And furthermore, 
the event where Batman puts on a robot suit and fights Superman is not the whole thing. It's, it's less than half of the entire run. Many other events occur inside of Dark Knight Returns, and the context of Batman putting on a robot suit and fighting Superman is way more complex than they were willing to approach in the film. There is a great deal more thematic buildup. Um, there is more of a plot to it in that, and spoiler alert for The Dark Knight Returns, by the way, you can watch an animated version of it starring Peter Weller as Batman, which is excellent. Um, they only changed a couple things, and I don't think that they really affected it that much. He fought Superman in public to send a message, and he also did it as part of his attempt to fake his own death. He never intended to win the fight against Superman. He intended to have the fight, to have everybody see it, so that everyone in the world would go, Oh, Batman's dead. So that he could effectively retire and pass the mantle of what it is he was doing to the sons of Batman, and so on and so forth. And also to humble Clark a little bit, to make him realize there are people out there who can hurt you, because at that point Superman had become a hyper-fascist, authoritarian figurehead of the American government. He... He ripped off. He like he he became a part of the effort to register all the superheroes and the metahumans in the world. He killed several of them. Superman did. He cut off Oliver Queen's arm, the Green Arrow. He cut off his arm because he refused to register with the U.S. government. And in fact, that's the guy who hit Superman with the kryptonite gas in the graphic novel. Is the Green Arrow is nearby with a an arrow tipped with kryptonite dust, and he draws the bow with his teeth because he only has one arm and fires it. And uh, it's a it's a, it's a good story. It's a good story. Again, it's not my favorite Batman. I don't think it's the direction that Batman should generally be taken in. But as far as it just being like an Elseworlds side story, it's great. And then you have Batman vs Superman. And I mention all these details because, again, the development of Batman vs. Superman is painfully transparent. Somebody read that comic, got bored and fell asleep through most of it, and then they saw him in the robot suit fighting Superman and were like, let's do that! And someone went, oh, slow down, there's a lot of context we have to build up before we can do that. And he went, fuck you, no, no we don't, we'll just make up some stupid bullshit. I don't know, Lex Luthor kidnaps his mom, and then they gotta punch each other. Like... I just... What is it, you guys? Do we have any Zack Snyder fans in chat right now? I don't want to come at you. I don't want to come at you if you're a Zack Snyder fan. Look, dude, I like things that are objectively bad, so far be it from me to criticize you for your fandom. But is there someone who can tell me what it is that Zack Snyder does that makes you a fan? Because I don't fucking get it. It's all so dumb. It's just it's it's meat-headed. Zack Snyder has like a like a like a fucking ribeye steak for a fucking head, and he just slams it into scripts, and then people read the the soaked-in juices afterwards, and uh, somehow it makes lots of money. I don't understand it. It doesn't just make money, it apparently has bred an entire group of fans who think that he should have complete creative control over the DC Universe. His Justice League is bad. His Justice League is fucking bad. I saw so many compliments for it. So many compliments for it when the Snyder Justice League released, and it's, it's fucking bad. I'm not saying that the, the, the Whedon version of it is good. It's not. It's also bad. Every single version of the Justice League movie is bad. There is no good version. Is Zack Snyder's version more artistically consistent? Okay, sure. And by that metric, it's probably better. It's longer. It's four hours fucking long. And you have people saying things like, oh, they, they develop these characters more completely and that makes it better. It's four hours long. If you didn't develop the characters more in four hours than two hours, I don't know what the fuck you spent your time doing. I don't think so, Roland. Are you thinking of Brian Singer, maybe? That's possible. Could I use the Snyder meathead technique for painting minis? Uh, you're liable to have, like, a fly or a bug problem. 
I think that might have been Brian Singer. Yeah, Brian Singer is a, a diddler. Brian Singer is a bit of persona non grata these days. Ooh, Storm Report is about to start. Get to a stopping point here. I think that Zack Snyder did a good job with Dawn of the Dead in 2000... 2001? 2002? Was that 2001 or 2002? I want to say it was 2001. No? No, it was like... That might have been... Was that 2005? 04, 05, maybe. Anyway, Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead, I think he did a good job with that. It's still not, like, an amazing movie, but it was fresh and it was interesting at a time when nobody else was doing that. And if I'm being completely honest, I'm not a huge fan of George Romero's Dawn of the Dead. That might seem like heresy. Um, over the years, I've become more of a fan of the Return of the Dead series than of the Living Dead. But that's personal preference. Interested in his not Star Wars movie. Didn't like the Zack Snyder flash scene where he creeps over the girl's about to die, then grabs a hot... Yeah, that scene was fucking... St and there was so much praise for that scene, and it was so dumb. The, 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 his application of physics in that scene was like, Dude, if you're just gonna, like, throw physics out the window, like, do that. That's fine. But he both has... He has the Flash running in his normal clothes, and he has, like, his shoes disintegrate because of the friction and stuff, and, like, he touches a pane of glass, and it shatters as he goes through it, and it's all cool warpy stuff, but it's like, his other clothing is fine, which doesn't make any sense if his shoes exploded. And then, he's able to grab, I assume Iris West is who that was supposed to be. I don't know if they said that it was Iris West. But, and he's able to grab her and move her out of the way without exploding her? And I get that the Flash's powers are nonsense. I understand that. The Flash... The Flash requires the greatest suspension of disbelief of almost any character in the DC Universe. You have to wave your hands in the air and go, It's the Speed Force, and that's why it happened. I understand that. But if it's the fucking Speed Force, then why did his shoes explode? And yeah, it was creepy as hell. It was super duper creepy. Like, she's about to die, and he's just like, Oh, I'm in love with you. You're so pretty. Let me touch you without your permission. That's really, that's really great. And then he, like, steals a hot dog, and I... And the scene goes on for, like, I, that had to have been, like, a three-minute sequence. And it was... <sighs> if his other clothes exploded, he would be the streak. It's funny, that's what they called him in the show. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long sequence, right? I don't want to I don't want to I don't want to get into the numerous individual problems with that scene because I don't like the scene and I don't fucking care about it and I've told you guys before like I only really bother analyzing things that I enjoy for the most part. But I suspect that the upcoming Ezra Miller Flash movie is going to be fucking hot garbage. I only base that on literally every appearance we've seen of him as, of him as the Flash so far. In which he has been... Regrettable. Let me get these guys moved out of the way. Let's check out what y'all have been posting in the Storm Report. And I can come back to finishing off these men-at-arms a little bit later. It's fair to say that all of the DC heroes, nanotanks, particularly the DC heroes, more so than even the Marvel heroes, and the Marvel heroes are like uh, genetic super soldiers and, and chaos witches and um, vibranium synthesoids and alien space gods. Like, somehow... The DC Universe requires an even greater suspension of disbelief most times than Marvel heroes do, so, like, I understand. You have to suspend your disbelief to buy into characters like Bruce Wayne, like Barry Allen, like Clark Kent. I'll tell you what I value. I value internal consistency. 
Like, okay, tell me what the nonsense is. Tell me the way that you're going to break reality. Give me the made-up rules. Will they work in reality? No. That's fine. But develop your rules and then be consistent as you write. And Snyder cannot. Snyder cannot. Also, I'm going to note one thing before I close out my irritation with the Zack Snyder Justice League. I'm going to say one fucking thing. And this is going to be in a mild defense of Joss Whedon, which people may not want to hear, but I'm just going to say this, okay? In the flashback scene, when all when when Darkseid invades and all the bad men are coming to take Earth, there's all, like, that big invasion scene that doesn't make any sense, where Zeus is like a turbo beefcake. Um, and this, this, this should be taken as an overall indictment of Zack Snyder. Joss Whedon's version of it, there's a Green Lantern. In both versions of it, there's a Green Lantern. I mean, it's just the same movie. Joss Whedon had the Green Lantern with his ring do things like make a big hammer to hit somebody. I think he made a wall to block somebody at one point. He did a few things with his ring. In Zack Snyder's version that has more Green Lantern in it, he shoots beams. He, sh he shoots, he points his fist and laser beams come out. There's no hammers, there's no objects, there's no manifestations of the Green Lantern power. Why? Why? What was the point? Is it important? No. Does it really detract from the movie that much? No. Is it, in my opinion, indicative of the overall problem with the way Zack Snyder approaches these projects? Yes. He is a boring asshole with no fucking imagination. He can do a very, very few handful of specific things. Zeus is a beefcake because Superman is God and Zack Snyder is that subtle. Yeah, the dude who played Zeus stole that whole scene. He was just a raging beefcake who had, like, just cut all his body fat. Like, he was so vascular and he's just like, I rage and I shoot fucking lightning out of my nipples. I was like, uh, okay, I buy that as Zeus. Yeah, okay. I think Zack Snyder probably wanted to personally grease that dude up before every scene. I only base that on the entirety of 300. <laughs> and it's, I think, appropriately homoerotic visuals. Because let's face it, the ancient Greeks, they had very different concepts of masculinity than most of Western society does today. And you may not want to admit it, you may not be comfortable with it, but I promise you that the Spartans at Thermopylae were getting uh, a little intimate around the campfire at night, boys. A little intimate. And on that weird note about Leonidas probably banging his soldiers, probably covered in olive oil, let's take a look at the storm report. All right, locusts and gentle mechs, get ready to feast your eyes on glory paint and wet palettes with the occasional culinary atrocity thrown in on tonight's storm report. Brought to you by viewers like you. Was that was that cruelly stereotypical to assume that they used olive oil as lube? <laughs> Oh guys, I apologize. Give me give me one second. I need to get up for just I'll be I'll be one minute that we'll get going, alright? I'll be right back.
Ah, okay. Here we go. What happened to Pretzel? Oh, there it is. I just sat down, like, in the, the brief break. Let's get going and see what everybody has been posting tonight. I was like, has it just been silent the whole... Did I just, like, get up and Pretzel stop playing? How awkward. <laughs> up first, we have our... Our, our... Shit, what's the word I'm looking for? Bi-weekly, tri-weekly update from Mafik. Finally got myself a new premium tank from the event today and drew a waifu out of it, wasting no time at all. Ooh, look at that. Look at that ugly little brick. VK16801P. God, what a hideous machine. I'm sure that there is a backstory to this nasty looking some bitch. Is it a prototype? Is it is it a late war effort to to make simpler, faster to produce tanks? I'm sure somebody knows. And that turned into oh come on. You know you wanna hug me, right? Got some of that brutalist architecture worked in there. I like the the, the wall breaker cannon slung low on the hip. Thick thighs. Thick thighs as we know save lives, but in this case, maybe take a few, too. It was a concept tank before... Oh, okay, okay, I gotcha. It's a paper fantasy. This was this was some engineer's pipe dream that never really made it to full production, eh? Before they moved on to a uh, more reliable design. Interesting. So-called napkin waffle. <laughs> Oh. Oh, they have such a way with words, those Germans. I like the inclusion of the sort of Bavarian braids. Nicely done, Mafik. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna ping you a little bit later on Discord. I intend to get you an artist channel set up on the Discord so that you can uh, get these all in the same place. Weighs twice as much. Yikes! That's that's a, that's a big old pile of steel, with double treads no less. Look at that, four different tread assemblies. Yikes! It was data nerd. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for doing that. Coming down, coming down. Here we have from Aberben, Saturn, Jupiter, with bonus moon. But I forgot to figure out which one. If it's Jupiter, yeah, that, that could be. There, there are a lot. There are a lot of Jovian moons. Uh, a sunspot and a lunar surface shot. The planetary... The prop, the planetary are probably my best to date. The planetary shots, I'm going to guess, are probably my best to date. Check out that great red spot. The solar and lunar are first step type of photos, so hopefully we've got some cool improvements to come on those fronts. Damn. Damn. That's some detail. Project Dark Fox, thank you so much for taking care of that. I've got to get you up here one of these nights, one of one of one of these one of these months, ever been for like a long weekend because I think you would really enjoy setting up. We've got a little bit of light pollution from DIA. You can see the glow of DIA just over the horizon, but we have some really really nice night skies on the other side of our uh, windbreak which kind of takes care of a lot of that. And I would love to see what you can get out here. I agree, more, 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 more. That was a good idea, like Thunderhead always says, take the time to appreciate how far you've come. Absolutely. Not just where you are, but where you started. Keep those first, mi those first minis, pictures, illustrations, models, whatever. Put them side by side with the current work sometimes. It feels damn good. It is a wonderful way to see how you've grown, and oh yeah. Man, did that ever get more refined. <laughs> Ooh, look at that. That's lovely. And here we have Jupiter. Du, 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 until boom, look at that red spot. It really is an amazing shot of it. Space is big, you guys. Space is real fucking big. We're never going to space. We're going to sit here and we're going to look up at it. And we're going to take pictures of it. And it's going to be wonderful. And by the time that we would have reached a point that we could have actually gone there and done anything with it, it's going to be nothing but robots owned personally by Jeff Bezos. 
He's never letting us go to space. He's gonna he's gonna claim Mars. <laughs> Damn it. Why is the future so bleak? <sighs> At least we can get pretty pictures of it. At least we have fantastic people like Iberben out there taking these wonderful shots and sharing our universe with us. Iberben, thank you so much. Bezos and his dick rocket. That is th that comparison is so obvious that it's like there's no way he didn't know. There's no way that wasn't on purpose. There's no way in hell that he didn't look at that and go, <laughs> look, it's like I'm riding a giant dick. <laughs> he knew. Oh, he knew. Here we have from Hethrier, a defiled archon for a friend's army. Ooh. Well, that's looking real nice. I like the tones that you have on the... Those wings are made of skin, aren't they? I don't mean like, okay, most wings are made of skin, but I mean like other people's skin. Usually, when you have wings made of skin, oh, we got a clip from Iberben. How nice! Uh, you normally, when you have wings, they're made of your skin. This appears to be made of other people's skin, and notably their faces, which admittedly seems like a bad piece of skin to use for a wing. But given that this is for, I'm estimating warma hordes. I don't, I don't think that that really matters too much. He's, he's probably just flying with magic anyway. I like the design of it. The nasty little bone. Fing what did we decide that the fingers are called in wings? Riot Sister came up with a name for it. Was it Fingle Dingles? It was something like that. It was, yeah. You know what's funny is um, Ray Bradbury did it first, Wildstar. Ray Bradbury did it first with the Great Space Fuck, where they built a giant rocket and they directly compared it to a giant flying dick. And they even loaded the head of it with the genetic material of everything on Earth. And the metaphor... It was called the Great Space Fuck. And the idea was that we, as a species, were going to fuck the Andromeda Galaxy. We were firing a, a giant rocket-powered reproductive organ into space loaded with our genetic material intending to seed the new galaxy with... with the life of Earth. We were quite literally fucking Andromeda. But that was funnier. <laughs> and then as the rocket took off into space, it was like everybody on Earth who was watching it take off all looked up to the sky and shouted, Fuck you, Andromeda! <laughs> oh, if only space exploration was actually so fun. Lovely highlights on this, by the way. Hathrier, love the use of this kind of lavender, purple, blue, and the little green right here. Nice composition on there. Good-looking white armor. Love the golds. Love the skin tones on the face in particular for a Grimkin army. Okay. Really interesting models for Grimkin. Really, really interesting. I like the disturbing skin tones that you have on the face wings. Really good job picking those out so that it is both obvious what they're meant to be and yet it all kind of blends in. I'd imagine it looks really, really nice at average viewing distance. Phalanges? Would they be metacarpals? They'd just be fingers. Because, I mean, a wing is just, it's an evolution of this. You, they even have little thumbs. They're just usually little vestigial claws at that point. But yeah, they grow. Like this would be a wing if I had a bunch of webbing and it was much, much larger, relatively speaking. Let's take a look at it with a UV light. Oh my god! Uh, Fwingers! I like where Vergaderung's head is at. This is, um... I don't, I, don't, I don't like this. This makes me very uncomfortable. Of course you would, Waffles. Of course you would. I mean, well done, but also, let's never turn on the UV light when we're playing games. The question is, since we all know the only things that glow in UV, Hathrier, did you use blood, urine, or semen? That is the ultimate question. Really <laughs> nicely done. I'm sure that your friend is going to be really, really pleased with that final project. Final product, rather. Sorry, I can't word tonight. Here we have from Machine God. So yes, while the spider boss was getting away with murder. Oh, the jokes. The Papa Roach jokes. You won't be able to get across the hate. Uh, when you see the next Super Heavy in the works. I can't deal with this. 
example, because your bunk house would look like a Jackson Pollock. I I don't want to think too much about that. <laughs> I think the concern is we'll have to sell our souls to the company store in order to go to space as normal citizens, so to speak. Yeah, the, the question of how legality works in space is a big one, too. It's one that sci-fi authors have been kind of grappling with and dealing with for a long time, but the ultimate reality is going to be that we have to sign over our human fucking rights to go to space, I estimate. Ad Astra. Was Ad Astra any good, Wildstar? I didn't see it. Is this the giant one from the end of Mech Assault 2, the giant mech that you had to fight? Because uh, I'm getting that. It has been probably since shortly after Mech Assault 2 released that I actually played that game. But I'm guessing from what I remember and from the fact that we have all these disconnected cablings down here that this was the big torso of the huge um, Comstar Word of Blake mech that you had to fight. I don't remember what it looked like enough to say for sure, but if I was a betting man, that's what I would bet. Was it awful? Oh, that's sad. Even Wildstar, you don't have anything particularly good to say about it. Slow burn, didn't hate it, don't remember loving it either. Wow, what a... Uh, it's almost the worst thing a movie can be is forgettable. At least if it's, like, truly terrible, it might... It might fire you up a little bit. It might make you feel something. And personally, that's my metric for a, a decent movie, even if it's kind of bad. If it can make me feel something, then at least it was worth the time. Really nice work on this, though, Machine God. Machine God has been working on a whole lot of the 3D printable mech assault versions of battle mechs. Now, for those of you who played Mech Assault, Mech Assault 2, and are looking to get into Battletech, I cannot recommend his Kickstarter. His Kickstarter, his Patreon enough. Some assembly required, I believe, is the name. Uh, one of these days, I'll remember to actually put a link here in chat because I do like to go ahead and spread the word on that one. Flying into space seems was the only thing you remembered. Paid like three hundred bucks for a pillow. Yikes! That's a bad time. It was corporate interest that drove the initial exploration and settlement of North America. Roland, have you read The Man Who Bought the Moon? Uh, was that Heinlein? The man, the man who bought the moon. No, the man who sold the moon. Sorry, was the name of the story. Somebody help me out. Was the man who sold the moon? Was that Eismov or was that Heinlein? I should remember which one it was. Okay, yeah, that was Heinlein. The man who sold the moon is an interesting dive into that concept. It doesn't. It doesn't sound like Asimov. That's why I thought, like, no, that sounds more like Heinlein, because Heinlein was a lot more sardonic than Asimov was. Asimov was more really, really high concept with things like the Caves of Steel and the Robots of Dawn, whereas Heinlein had his feet a bit more on the ground, so to speak. Let's go ahead and take a look at Hethry's next Grimkin posting. While we're talking about that, ooh... How much of this is showing? Is any of it cut off? No, you can see the whole thing. Excellent. One of the most interesting things I remember from the man who sold the moon was a very, very realistic position that Heinlein took on the notion of space must be colonized by private interests. Must be colonized by private interests. Because if something as simple as... If the first base on the moon, for instance, were a government-controlled base, it would by necessity be a military base. And the first time that there's a military base on the moon, the first time that a government has the capacity to do something as simple as just drop a heavy enough piece of tungsten at the right time and annihilate a city with a multi-megaton blast, the, I mean, you just have to think about it from the perspective of if you build a military base on the moon, what you've just done psychologically is you've created a situation where no matter where you are on Earth, if you time it right and look up, you can see say, an American military base. What would that do to world politics? I'm not saying that world politics are in a great place, but it's an interesting notion. Like, what would it do to people's minds? No, it's more complex than that, nanotanks. Obviously, that is a wild oversimplification. But for the purposes of argument, what would that do to people if no matter where you were in your home country, you could look up and be like, there's an American military base right there. I'm looking at it. Oh my God, that would tear us apart. 
That would <laughs> that would destroy us. Let's go ahead and actually have a look at this really cool Grimkin. What is this model called, first of all, Hethrier? Because I don't know. I've seen this model a lot. You knew that it's different, though, nanotanks. And it, it's more conceptual, obviously. It, 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 more, it more has to do with the broad colonization of space than it does with the particulars of, say, satellites. We've gotten used to satellites as time goes on. What would you... What if you could use a giant laser to write your name on the moon? You mean like Chairface Chippendale Shock? The show for all mankind talks about... I haven't seen that one. Yeah, we're a little off. We're a little off topic. <laughs> the Slaughterhouse. I've seen a number of versions of this. I fucking love that your version really focuses on the eyes with the UV reactive paint. That is so cool. And I like how it's the same paint that you have on the little moral mushrooms. Really nice. It, yeah, Wildstar, but... I don't even think we're gonna build any shit on the moon. The more we talk about it, the less likely it seems like it's gonna happen, because the more we realize, like, what the fuck do we want to build on the moon for? Like, what are we gonna do with it, really? Eh, it's not worth the money or the time or the effort. It's more just a fun idea. I really, really like what you've done with all the dirt and this, like, the zombie hand coming up, grasping at the gravestone. Nice skin tone on that. It's subtle, but it pops out. I like the little dude's bare butt. Uh, you've, you've gone ahead and, and spent some special time highlighting the butt. Nice work on the uh, the little touch of OSL that we have here from the fire coming out of the chimney. Really, really nice looking mini half rear. And this is, again, for your friend's Grimkin, Grimkin army. I think he's going to like this. If one thing were to jump out at me, if, if I were to note one thing that jumps out at me at this model, I would say that your wood, the colors you've chosen for your wood texture are interesting. You didn't just go with one color the whole way around. Your roof has a nice, distinct, warm tone to it. We have an almost greenish pale hue to these little broken wood slats that sort of form teeth. We get a lot of that also coming up in here through the gnarled wood, which has some greens worked into the recesses. It's very visually interesting. These little splashes of jade, I think, do a lot to set off these warmer tones. Ooh. This is a really nice looking model, Hathrear. The stone highlighting is, again, simple but effective. It's all very stylized. And I mean, it has to be given the nature of the model, given how stylized the entire thing is from concept to execution. I think you really leaned into the style and I think it paid off. Yeah, exactly, Wildstar. The wood colors do a great job of painting the face, of, of bringing across the whole image of the figure. And under the UV light, holy crap, does it ever stand out. This is wonderful. I like how you've really focused on the sort of, uh... I'm getting a very Evil Dead vibe. Off of the whole thing, for one, but particularly off of this portal and the choice of the purple and magenta with the glow effect. It looks very much like the portal... I guess that one was in blue. But it, look, it reminds me of the portal from the end of uh, Evil Dead 2. His army is stylized really and use the cartoony touches. I would think that all of the Grimkin need the cartoony touch. Or it's just not going to work. Chaotic Harmony! Third convention mini done. A Sword of Light Sunder. I love seeing that at this point, Chaotic is starting to lean into and practice more lensing effects. This is a really fairly simple, basic lensing job that he has done here on the cockpit and on the lasers. It's coming along. It's definitely coming along. This is a, a great example of, of exactly what Ben was talking about. Save your first minis to compare to your latest because... We've got some pictures of Chaotic Harmony's first minis in Showcase, and he's got some of them on his Discord. We need to pull some of them up, because in the last year or so that he has been painting steady, he has come a really quite a long way. That's how I discovered Chaotic Harmony, was he was doing a little bit of painting. He wasn't even sure that he was going to continue doing it. And I think I won an Iron Wind Medals figure off of a giveaway on his channel, like the first time that I met him. Still haven't painted it, but um, it would take a miracle to get me to paint an Iron Wind Metals figure these days. The last one I did was a Shadowhawk, and I, I hate that damn thing and how hard it was to assemble. Yeah, this is a very old mold. 
of the Sunder. This is this is definitely a, a classic piece that he got his hands on. But again, Catac Harmony is going to be going to Retro Palooza, a retro themed convention, to to rep his artist table, talk about BattleTech, and uh, yeah, push 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 a little bit of product and inform people that yes, as a matter of fact, people do still play BattleTech. So I think a retro Sunder is pretty appropriate. Nice job on the lensing. Your, your blending has come a long way. You still have more work to do, Chaotic, but what you're doing now is a whole different skill level than what you were doing a year ago. Well done. Here we have from Ion Raptor, new mech, who this? Started on a legacy for HBS Battletech on a whim. The torso actually gave me a lot of trouble, even though it looks so simple. The more I do of it, the more it reminds me of the Bruin I did a long time ago. I don't doubt that. Some of what appear to be the simplest designs can give you a lot of trouble, depending on what programs you're using. Um, complex curves, curves that change their radius as they go, can be tricky, particularly when you're using CAD programs. Like, it's easier to do in mesh sculpting, but it's also difficult to have it as geometrically precise as I know guys like you and I like at Ion Raptor. These turrets look so much like tank turrets that are just stapled onto the shoulders, it's crazy. It looks so much like it. I love the extra venting that you have on the edges. Really overall good barrel design for the weapons. I see, Ion Raptor, I see the trouble that you went to to get this just so. And I appreciate it. Those of us who 3D model absolutely appreciate it. You do not go unnoticed, Ion Raptor. By the way, guys, can we get a shout out real quick? I think Ion Raptor's in chat. If we haven't gotten a shout out for Ion Raptor, we really, really should. Dude does some amazing 3D modeling streams. If you're interested at all in getting into some simple CAD 3D modeling for 3D printing purposes, you need to check out this stream. Just trying to 3D model the front of the Phantom 2 from Rebels. I don't even know how to describe it. The the Phantom 2 was the that was a uh, velocipede, not a velocipede. Um, it was it was a Clone Wars shuttle. She the peed. God, it's an even dumber word. Yeah. It was the little Clone Wars uh, Confederate Systems. Confederacy of Independent Systems ship, right? Yeah. That has some complex curvature on it. It's 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 it seems like it would be simpler to model than it actually is. And it's always frustrating. Like, if you look at the Shadowhawk that I made, that's that's one where I have that same problem. Where it's like, I can't describe to you the difficulty that I went to to create these tiny little precise curves that probably don't matter that much. If I'm being honest, I could have done a lot of them just straight and nobody ever would have noticed. But um, I think it's worth the effort. And you know what? It, it's good practice. The more you do, the easier it comes. These tasks that seem insurmountable when you start are pretty soon just how you get started on new projects. This is why we practice. This is is why we have projects that we don't intend to be like you, what what is the phrase? The the master has failed more times than the apprentice has attempted. You have to keep trying if you want to make it. And you find tricks. You definitely find tricks, particularly for making complex curved surfaces. Either way, really, really nice job, Ion Raptor. Uh, I can't help but wonder if you're going to work on this one, Ion Raptor, on one of your streams. I'd love to come in and uh, and check out your work on the, the pelvis, legs, and arms. Here we have, from Cybran Knight, our very own Metalcore Collectibles. After a few months on the water, my gun plat came in. And now I'm up to four Leos. Oh, Leos. Oh, Leos, I love these suits so much. Like, I like grunt suits in general, but the design of the Leo is just fantastic. Oh my god, you got Mercurius and V8. For some reason, you got Sandrock and a Magonaut Core custom. I mean, those, those are okay. It's, you know, these are... These are also mechs that appeared in that show. But when you put them next to V8, Mercurius, and the Leo, like, I just... Just gonna kind of... Pretend like those ones aren't there. I love Mercurius and V8. I, I think they're cooler than the... What's the mech that came out of them? Was it the Virgo? Or was the Virgo the, the, the space mobile suit that turned into a Starfighter? No, that was the Taurus. Wasn't it? Wait, what was it? Somebody help me out. What was the... 
what was the mobile suit that they made out of the prototypes for V8 and Mercurius? Because they combined those technologies into one singular mobile suit, and then I think they made it into a mobile doll. Steel Rebel, welcome in. Good to see. You. I'm gonna pour myself another drink here real quick. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much for getting that shout out. Guys, if you're interested in oil painting and you want to see somebody who is a lot fucking better at it than I am, go give Steela Rebel a follow. Also, we finally landed on a model that we want to paint for a dual stream. As was suggested by chat, we are going to be each printing up a Judge Dread bust that we are going to be painting uh, at the same time. As part of a dual stream, I am going to be heavily leaning on the artistic stylings of Simon Bisley from mine, and I'll be very, very curious to find out which artistic influences Steela decides to go with. Judge Dredd has been illustrated by a, a number of artists over the years, and while they all conform to certain broad decisions and in, in, in colors, each artist really did kind of have his own take. I really like Simon Bisley's version of Dread, though. It was so dirty and so highly and heavily and sharply contrasted. Think it was Virgo? Yeah, I think that's right. Wait, Wolf, I'm sorry. I like the Leo better than the Wing Zero. I'm sorry. I, I love you for building Wing Zero, but the Leo is just so, so hot. White Wolf, you are technically chat. Technically speaking, that is correct. <laughs> but yes, it was White Wolf who mentioned it, suggested it, linked it, and that's what we're going to be doing. And thank you so much for that. The Taurus was the Transformer. Yeah, okay, the Taurus was the one with the big pointy, like, clan hood looking thing. I know that's not what it was meant to look like. It's just, it's always what it makes me think of. I should go with a, a more friendly comparison. It has, like, a... Uh, What's the what, what's the hat? What's the Pope hat? What's that called? I know there's a word for it. I can't think of it now. It's a uh, you know the, the tall Catholic hats. Somebody help me move away from a reference to the KKK. A mitre. Thank you so much, <laughs> Roland. You saved me again. I was like, there has to be a better comparison. Oh my God, no. Yes, it looks like it's wearing a mitre and it has big tall shoulder pads and it turns into a space fighter for some reason. I always personally like the Ares. Because it looks like it's wearing a pilot helmet for no fucking reason at all. Doesn't help that half of them were white. I'm trying... I'm, I don't think that it was intentional Ion Raptor. I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. <sighs> and of course, can't have new models without updating the backlog. Hello, backlog, my old friend. Come to add to you once again. a lot of models. That's a lot of unbuilt models. But as someone who indulges, as someone who heavily indulges in retail therapy, I cannot criticize this even one little bit. The Ares was a what? What? Roland, the Ares was cool. The Ares, well, yeah, it looks like a store shelf, right? <laughs> I look at this and I'm like, hmm, let's go shopping. We've got some we got some War Machine up here. Uh, we, we lean into the Kill Team down here. We, we pick up some more Games Workshop products. Plenty of books, codices, rule books, and then just all the Gundams. Just all the Gundams. Holy crap. I have one. I have one kit of that style. And I'm going to build it before I buy any more. <laughs> oh, sometimes I crack myself up. Roland, explain yourself. How was the Ares a piece of shit? Give me some reason. Give me some reason, because I liked it. Here we have from Chrysala. Finally, it's finished. Well, one of them anyway. Now that the Scout variant of the Dauber is finished, I can change up a few details for the Watcher, along with the new head, and then start on the next variant. Flame effect shamelessly stolen from another project that I was helping with. Ooh. Ooh, that's nice. I like the kind of, like... It, it reminds me of the Stinger, with its, like, a CRT for a head. Underarmed for a mass production suit with low flight speed. Roland, but we have to remember that the Oz Foundation was creating mobile suits in a world where who else had mobile suits? 
who, Roland, seriously, who else in the Gundam Wing universe had mobile suits beside Oz? There was, like, the Magonaut Corps had really a handful, comparatively speaking. And that's pretty much it. Am I wrong? Uh, I should I should clarify. Who manufactured mobile suits other than Oz? Because they everyone bought their mobile suits from Oz. For the most part, mobile suits were not being manufactured to fight other mobile suits. Mobile suits were being manufactured to fight ground forces, traditional conventional ground forces, and not necessarily ground forces with large quantities of air support. The Ares was not designed as an air superiority fighter. It was designed as a mobile weapons platform to take out poorly armed conventional ground forces, uh, rebels, engage in police actions, that sort of thing. Now, I'm probably thinking more about this than they did when they wrote it now. <laughs> but I think that that holds up. Because in a world where there is no competitor to the Ares, it's fantastic. If you're just a guy on the ground with a machine gun, a couple of trucks, and maybe an artillery piece, the Ares is a devastating piece of hardware for one pilot to be able to take you out. I love the running pose on this. I really dig the design of the feet. Big, nasty claws. Really nice work, Kursala. I like the shape of the torso, too. I appreciate that you have this little... The... the I don't know what that would be called. It just it gives it a nice shape from the center of the chest out to the shoulders. Very nicely done. Although now that I'm looking at it, all I can see is that this is an eye and this is an eye and then it's got buck teeth and bottom teeth. <laughs> I don't know why that's what my brain does, but that's that's the pattern that I picked out and now I'm never going to be able to unsee it. So thanks for that and thank you for sharing. <laughs> Oh, God. Oh, God, the memes. Here we have from Squared. Family is visiting this week, and that means pizza time, cheese and pepperoni. Old tricks are the best tricks. Oh, that looks good. I'm right back to right back to wondering what it is I'm having for dinner. Ooh, so much melty cheese. I like how there's so much cheese that the pepperoni gets lost in it. That looks fucking delicious. That pizza is thick. That's one thick pizza. Oh, damn. Oh, uh, yeah. Just rub that cheese on there and go ahead and melt it onto the pepperoni for me. Oh, my God. Yeah, bite into that cheese. Really get into the crust there. Yeah, rub it in. Okay, let's move on. Here we have from Roll. Oh no. What? Whoa. Whoa. What? And also, why? God bless America, am I right? <laughs> this might not even be in the U.S. for all I know. This is this is horrific. It's Japanese. Okay. Okay, fair enough. I like the pizza better. <laughs> but uh, honestly, this being Japanese makes more sense of it to me. It's 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 culturally a thing that they do is uh, you know, way too goddamn much. <laughs> Why are there popsicles stuck in? What? It's a pitcher Sunday. It's also meant for three people. See, okay, there is fundamentally the difference between if this was a Japanese dish versus an American dish. In Japan, this would come with three spoons. In America, it would come with one. Well, thank you for sharing that uh, monument to diabetes with us today, Roland. <laughs> oh, here we have from Wombat Combat, the top half of the dune crawler that got worked on this weekend. I think we need more bright red dry brushed and select spots. The neutron laser shown is in base color for comparison. Agreed. Let's have a look. Do we need more bright red dry brushed and select spots? And yeah, the neutron laser, this is your base red that you're dry brushing up from. I think so. You could go higher with this red. A good, like, if, if each time you do a layer of dry brushing, you're just dry brushing fewer and fewer areas, you're moving in, a right, in the right direction. It looks like this is an overall dry brush. 
I would go with another brighter red. I would hit, I would focus on the edges here, here at the bottom. Uh, I would focus particularly on the corners, maybe leave the middle of the edges a little bit darker. Focus on the top edges and details here. Try to hit some of these without getting the middle of the panels too much. And then maybe do one more layer, one more round of dry brushing where all you hit are the corners. I think that that would work nicely. I, I do think, I do think at least one more, arguably even two more rounds of dry brushing Wombat Combat would yield a pretty good result on this particular Doom Crawler. Really nice looking base coat on this, nice and smooth. I like the differentiation of the metal tones that you have here on the Neutron Laser, nicely done. I fully magnetized one of these once and it was a goddamn nightmare, let me tell you. Really nice work. Legs for comparison, oh absolutely yes. Absolutely yes, you want to go higher. You might even go one more round on the legs. You might even, and I'm talking just hitting, like, just the corner here, just the middle here, just the spikes here, like smaller and smaller and smaller areas. I hope that that's helpful, Wombat Combat. Here we have from Lore Friendly, Behold! my trash. All the parts on the cutting mat need magnetization. Gonna do that after some sprue I added to provide a mounting point finishes drying. Also, I should start painting my models for the next round of the league. That's next week. And I've only just primed. A week in bed. A week you can get a lot of good work done. Yeah. I've done this particular job before. I've done the, the magnetized all the weapons on the Dune Crawler. It's a process. These days, with access to what I have now, I would probably just whip up replacements in CAD and 3D print them with magnet sockets already built into them. But I can assure you that with some effort, it is definitely possible to do. As you noted, you're adding pieces of sprue in order to create mounting points. That sounds like precisely what I did. I think you're on the right track, Lord Friendly. Looking forward to that Doom Crawler getting that green coat of paint. Here we have from NB Toby, Modular Extreme Environment Habitat. Not sure if there's a need for it, but what's done is done. Mostly original. The solar arrays and habitat rings were influenced by another design, but I'm not sure who. Oh, these are looking nice. Is this, a, this is for 6mm, I'm assuming, NB Toby. I really like this. Yeah, you got that, that moon base look to it. I love the real simple connectors. I dig it. There's some good greebling on here. It's simple. It's straightforward. It looks like it would print cleanly. It looks like it would paint nicely. I like the little hubs that you've got. Yeah, it, it does. It reminds me a lot of the Stratos Mars base. There's apparently a little dude on top of one of the build. Oh, is this is this little man right here? It's a little, little fella. Just kind of chilling. He's just a little guy. That seems about right, though, if you compare him to, like, the size of the door down here. I like that you've got a little, little turret pod with options. I really dig the look of the solar panels. I'm, I would very much look forward to seeing how these print when you get around to them. Nicely done. I want to see this with even just a layer of, of primer and dry brush. These guys in particular are interesting looking. I can't quite make out exactly what their geometry is from this angle. They look like they're supposed to be habitation pods. With like multiple little apartments kind of arranged in clusters on the sides. I want a closer look, NB Toby. I want a closer look. Something fierce. Here we have from Kursala. I spent way too much time tinkering with this and I'm not terribly happy with it. But it still looks pretty fun. I discovered a material in Keyshot that allows me to turn an object into a light source. So I knew I had to go and light up those exhaust fumes. The, later, the laser is also a light but didn't work as well due to the simple geometry. Oh, shit. This is what you were talking about earlier with a trick you discovered for rendering. Nice! That looks really fucking good. And yeah, it just kind of made this into a solid color, didn't it? It's good, like, without anything to reflect on. If you had, like, a cloud around the laser with, like, some, some particle effects or something, for it to reflect off of, I think that you would get the idea that it's a light so that it's a light source more clearly. As it is, there isn't really anything for it to to reflect light off of. 
but like in here in particular, you really get the effect because it's reflecting off of the back of the figure. Really nicely done. It's got a lightsaber, huh? <laughs> it certainly seems to. Here we have from Jungle Plague. I can tell it's been a long time since I've painted, but I got some more Thunderhead minis finished. Last bases. Oh, oh shit. Simple but effective cockpit glow, as always. One of my favorite features of the mechs that you do, Jungle Plague. These are the uh, unseen versions of the Wolverine and Shadowhawk or Blockhead and Dugram that I have available on Thingiverse. I always love seeing Jungle Plague get some paint down on these. It does such a great job, particularly with the weathering. This kind of goes to show how effective even a single color paint job can be with a little bit of weathering and a little bit of texturing and then using some good uh, color composition by dividing it up on the shoulders, adding in that red and white, that red and white, and then that fairly simple, really high contrast cockpit glow effect. I particularly like what you've done here on the Shadowhawks. It looks like the glow is, like you can tell sort of the geometry of the interior of the cockpit because it looks like the glow is coming up off of the panel back into the compartment where the pilot would be sitting. Like the light source is, is arranged where the control panel would be. A little bit trickier to do, obviously, with something like the, the blockhead, who doesn't have as much, you know, he doesn't have side windows and things like that. But this definitely gets the look across nicely. Very well done, Jungle Plague. Very well done indeed. And thank you so much for... I, I, I love seeing people painting the figures that I have designed and still haven't fucking finished painting myself. Oh my god. Uh... Just a little basement bow practice, trying to blow out the cobwebs. I've been thinking about getting back into archery lately. I've never done it competitively or even terribly seriously. I've just, from time to time, I've indulged in casual reflex target archery. And it is a nice meditative practice, particularly reflex archery. Like, reflex archery is just not using... Like, you don't use sights, you don't use, like, you know, compound bows with all kinds of crazy gear on them. It's just very simple aim bow, fire, and learn to fire by reflex. Thunderhead branded archery range win? I mean, I could do that tomorrow, technically. <laughs> Put the Thunderhead logo down there and just fire arrows into it. Sure, why the hell not? I'll tell you, those shots are closer than I would have gotten. Much, much closer than I would have gotten Jungle Plague. Nicely done. Here we have from the POV42. Painting all through the stream, so I may not be awake when we get to this part of the storm report, but this is the result of the advice from last time. Uh, getting my desert bus, dire wolf, orangey pink, highlighting on the places I really wanted to look bright. Stepping down almost black on the places I wanted to look dark. Green and purple washes from the shadows in those areas, respectively. Think that plus, I think that, plus getting my cockpit jewel to give it a clear focal point, really took it a long way. It made the two tones of red much more distinct. What do we have from this? Oh, yeah. Even just here, I can already tell. You can really tell where the deep red panels are by comparison. And, oh, yeah, once you view it from the front. And I agree. That nice little green focal point does a whole lot to the overall look. But you can absolutely tell we have a much darker red panel here. And then around the cockpit going into the, the lighter red on the shoulders. I'm so glad that that was helpful, 42. I do have VR. Quiver, you say. Hey, I'm going to have to take a look at that, Steve. Very nice, very clean, good update, and I think overall a pretty excellent one. You got to, particularly if you're doing two tones of the same color, you got to really lean into the contrast where you can. Nicely done, POV 42. Oh man, it's been way too long since I picked up one of my bows. I feel the same way. Here we have from Roland. This is just a this is just a plate of cookies. This is just a plate of delicious cookies. Why do you do this to me? You know how suggestible I am, Roland. You know how much I I, I now want cookies. Did you bring enough for everyone? Because I don't think you did. Right next to the paints. <laughs> right next to the paints. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. A nice crowded desk, but at least there's room for the cookies. Well, thank you for sharing your, your cookie extravaganza with us, Roland. Here we have from White Wolf, steadily getting there on the wings for this Ravel A10. 
Unfortunately, it's a Ravel, which means uh, doing a lot of gap filling. I've noticed that on their models. I'm glad it's not just me. So while things care, I've been working on my household nights for conquest since I still have nine plus of the things to build. I have to make six more. For the 1200 point list that I have built for conquest, I need to make six more household nights, and I cannot tell you how much I am looking forward to getting into painting those particular figures. They have so much really, really cool detail on them. And they're so large. Oh my god, they leave so much room for freehand and all kinds of crazy business. I'm looking forward to getting paint on them, but I have to make myself finish my infantry before I get into them, or I'll just, I'll just never paint my infantry. I know myself far too well. Really well-managed desk, desk space you got here. I gotta say, even your tools are relatively organized. Jesus, I have a terrible habit of, like, when I'm done with something, my hand takes over and it puts it someplace. No place conscious, just someplace. And then I get to play this wonderful game that I'm really, really good at called I Just Fucking Had It. Um, you would think I love it based on how often I play it. But I just don't. Don't have anything else so here, so thanks for the reminder, Google. Kind of contemplating pulling the gear out again was fun and rather enjoyable. Especially coaxing twice the megahertz out of processors. Ooh, we've got some business going on here. Mmm, Mike and Ikes. Can we talk about the fact that Mike and Ikes are objectively some of the best candy on the planet Earth? Like, Mike and Ikes are so good, I don't know why I even bother with most other fruit-flavored candy a lot of the time. Benching with Mike and Ikes is the best type of benching. Is this something that we can all get together on? Chat, is there anyone out there who will disagree with my rating of Mike and Ikes as, like, top-tier fruit-flavored candy? And by fruit-flavored, I mean flavored like, you know fruit candy flavor, not like real fruit, because that's not a thing. If there's anyone who would challenge the supremacy of Mike and Ike, speak now, or forever hold your peace. And I agree, yeah, the original flavor, the, the, the green box, that's the one. Oh, damn, I love those. They are so, so nice, but that is going to bring us to the end of tonight's Storm Report, and thus to the end of tonight's Tuesday stream. Oh, oh, I'm glad. I'm glad that my, uh, my my update to my button worked and it didn't turn my face off. That's that's a nice touch. I don't like candy. Does that count? No. Not liking candy just removes you from from the 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 pool of polled individuals. You effectively have abstained from the vote. Top tier. Okay, I'd accept that, Drakari. Superior, perhaps not. That is a that is a subject for some argument, but top tier. Absolutely, Stila. I, 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 I hope you've had a good morning. I hope that this uh, fairly chill stream has 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 brightened your morning just a little bit. Let's get a raid going. Who are we gonna raid? Megapedia is going. Holly Monsters painting. Commander Mittens is going strong. Let me see who else we got. Steep T's doing some painting. Lark Kerensky's playing Foxhole. Crocodile is painting. We don't get the chance to raid Crocodile very much, but for tonight, I think we're going to go ahead and raid over into Teal Sakiri's channel. It looks like he just got started. But Teal Sakiri is a fantastic streamer, a fantastic painter. Always has a quality stream. Guys, if you haven't followed him already, do me a favor, do yourself a favor, stick around for just a few minutes, check out the stream, see if you like what he's got going on. I suspect you probably will. He's a great streamer. He's, 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 he's a fucking fantastic dude. Um, <sighs> I want pizza. I want pizza so bad it's a little stupid. I ain't gotta do that to me to square. Pretty soon I'm gonna have to like ban food from the storm report so this stops happening because it's 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 kind of stupid ladies and gentlemen locusts and gentlemen right there you've got the schedule we are going to be back thursday the 29th doing some 3d design getting some more work done on the uh project dark fox trenchy 3d printable mech we've made some progress on that i'll probably have at least one test print done before that so that we can approach our joints with a little more knowledge and slightly fewer guesses 
Uh, Saturday, July the 31st is going to be Movie Night on the Thunderhead Studio Discord. Uh, please come out if you feel like watching with some commentary and chat. We're going to be watching probably Captain America, the First Avenger, and Independence Day. And then Sunday and Tuesday, we're going to be doing more Conquest in Oils as we work towards getting this whole process wrapped up. Thank you to everybody who came out tonight. Thank you to everybody who contributed to the Storm Report. And thank you, as always, to my amazing mod team. I'm going to send you over to Teals. So until next time, keep on painting. <laughs>